Uh, hi guys, it's Matt here, and I'm here with Matt. <laughs> hey, um, Matt. Matt vs. Japan. And yeah, I'm going to be interviewing him and asking him a few questions about um, learning Japanese. Um, so yeah, could you just tell us a bit about yourself and your yeah, journey? Yeah, yeah. So I'm also Matt. So uh, yeah, thanks for <laughs> thanks for having me on. Uh, I've been I've been doing AJAC for uh, close to seven years now, I think. And in, in like six months, it'll be uh, seven years. So that's pretty Christ. crazy. Yeah, I started when I was 16 years old. I had been learning Japanese, uh, like taking classes and stuff for like a year and a half before that. But of course, didn't get anywhere. Yeah. And I mean, I, d I discovered the AJAC website through a TQSM video, I think, like many others. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and once I read the site, it immediately clicked. It just made complete sense. It yeah. felt like uh, I just immediately became red-pilled. Mm. Uh, yeah. In Japanese, they have the expression "mekara uroko." Your eyes are just getting opened for the first time. It really felt like that. Yeah, yeah. And I actually didn't really get started until a few months after that because I don't know. I guess I was lazy, and I knew that I was going to be going to Japan mm. uh, for in the summer for just a couple weeks. Mm. And so I was kind of like, "Oh, if I go to Japan, I'll be super motivated." And so I'll just wait until then, <laughs> <laughs> which sounds like a really bad idea because yeah. that's kind of like, "Yeah, I'll just start my diet once the New Year like... starts." But it actually worked. I mean, I had a great time in Japan. I had there was one specific moment in Japan that I remember very vividly, which is I when I showed my host mom that video of Kasumoto when he's in the blue shirt. Oh yeah, yeah. and and what my my host mom said, uh, "Like, hey, if I only heard his voice." I would assume he was Japanese. And yeah, that was just yeah. like, okay, this is it. I'm going to yeah. do exactly what this guy says. Yeah, yeah. And awesome. so I came home, I got started on RTK, made my inversion environment, and I really never looked back. That was all I did. Uh, six months after that point, I went to Japan, and I was in Japan for six months as a high schooler because I wanted to have that typical anime experience of, you know, you're in <laughs> Japanese high school, uh, sitting the seat second from the back next to the window, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I talk about this in, in the video I have on my channel, my my three-hour-long AJAT journey video. But, yeah, I had some, some bad experiences in Japan, mostly because I was a little brat, uh, <laughs> but it was pretty good for my Japanese. And I came home, and I still wasn't fluent because it only been a year of age adding. But I just kept on age adding by myself in my room. Yeah. And after I kind of reached the, the two to three year point, this whole area of my life's kind of blurred together, so it's hard for me to remember. It's hard to put a date on like well, how good was I at this point. But yeah, around yeah. the two to three year mark, uh, I I was pretty fluent, and I had one. Uh, particular experience i remember where because most of the time i wasn't actually outputting japanese at all i was just inputting all yeah, the time yeah. doing srs reading watching shows listening mm -hmm. but there was one point where i had an opportunity to go and uh guide these japanese exchange students around my town so i i spoke japanese to them of course and it yeah. just came out so naturally it was just all there and and i i mean i wasn't of course i wasn't articulate as i am now but it really hit. That was when it really hit me. Like, oh crap! I'm fluent in Japanese. Like, <laughs> I can say everything I want to say. I understand everything they're saying. That's pretty. Awesome. All the other guys who are trying to study Japanese, who are also there, like, are ants compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> you felt like and, you know you're the king. Like you know. Yeah, it was awesome. It, was, it finally felt like all my work paid off. It was the ultimate ego boost. But yeah, a little bit after that point, I made the transition from comparing myself to, a, like, other gaijin or thinking yeah. of myself. It's as a gaijin to, to figure speakers, myself as like, yeah a native yeah, speaker yeah. and as soon as i started viewing myself through that light i realized oh shit i totally suck <laughs> yeah, and yeah. i'm pretty much still there i still suck compared to a native wow. speaker but uh i mean since the few years uh since i kind of made that transition i have been slowly getting better in a, a bunch of ways i kind of mm -hmm. if time i made that three hour video a little over a year ago uh, i reached a pretty hard point in my japanese journey where i, I was okay. kind of just really frustrated that uh I still wasn't being accepted by my by the Japanese people at my school as Japanese. Right. Okay. And I kind of just realized how how long of a journey it would really be to reach that point where I function just like a Japanese person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I guess it kind of discouraged me for a while, and I took some time away from, from Japan. Yeah. But uh, in the time since then, uh, I learned a lot of other stuff unrelated to Japanese and mm. Japan, and my perspective kind of changed a lot. And... I mean, the biggest thing that changed is I, I learned that before I was viewing my the process of learning Japanese as uh, trying to get, get to some goal so I could be done. Right, and, I see, yeah. And that was a really toxic mindset because I uh, saw yeah. that the goal was, was every time I improved, the goal got that much farther away. Yeah, I've uh, had like could that. always get better. Yeah, yeah and so yeah. I kind of realized that, I mean, if you view your life as trying to get to some end point, then you're wasting your life because yeah. you get to the end point and then you die. 
Yeah. And yeah. so I learned to kind of shift to viewing my life through a process. And I realized that the reason why learning Japanese w- was so fun was because I was constantly improving and I was focusing on where, like, how I was better than yesterday, not how yeah, far yeah. I was. Yeah, yeah. You're enjoying the process as, a, as opposed to enjoying getting to the actual goal, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. And so now I just, I, I view it as, as a process. And so I don't have any sort of final goal, like, where I think I'll just be done and I can retire. But yeah. I definitely have tons of room of improvement. Uh, rooms room to make improvement and uh i'm just yeah going <clears throat> one day at a time awesome out of all the people i've heard speak japanese on, on the internet you're probably the best so far and i mean that's coming from me i'm a gaijin so <laughs> you know it doesn't really mean anything thanks, but, thanks. i try but um mm-hmm. i showed the video of you speaking to my girlfriend and she was like you know holy shit is this guy japanese like <laughs> thanks well, well i mean yeah i mean so far it's, yeah it's, there, i i will say that it's easier if there is a difference between uh like your my real subjective ability and you know what i put out there on the internet because of course like when i put up that video like i i filmed it a couple times i made sure i sounded good yeah i was yeah, talking yeah. about a topic i was familiar with whereas if you just catch me in the wild you know i i probably wouldn't sound that good and yeah, the other I thing mean, is that even if even if I do sound good in the wild, you maybe it's it's doesn't feel as natural as me as speaking English. Maybe because it kind of feels like when I'm speaking English, I'm using like 10% of my brain just to make sure that I'm using the right words and I'm being articulate and yeah. sounding good. And then 90% actually thinking about the content of what I want to say. Yeah, yeah. But it feels more like 20 to 30% of my brain is yeah. just focused on the language when I'm speaking Japanese. So it kind of feels like I'm handicapped a little bit. And yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think that comes across because, I I mean, I've developed the ability to hide it. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but for me, I, I value my subjective ability, like my subjective sense of how good I am, almost more than my objective ability at this point. Okay, yeah. But still, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't but, yeah. necessarily matter too much because... You know, if you can still sound like that, then I suppose. Yeah, it is like I do. I, I, I will admit, I never get tired of, of Japanese people's reaction to uh, <laughs> when they when they realize that I'm not Japanese and I just taught myself. <laughs> do you ever just go on random Skype calls and just? Oh like... yeah, all the time. Well, well, the thing is with the the random Skype calls, uh, like if you go on the on the the so website it's, it's Skype, uh, Skype, Skype channel, channel Skatchang. That's Skatchang. Mm. But uh, there, are, everyone on there is already a weirdo, right? Like there are a <laughs> yeah. lot of. Because I mean, especially at least the time of day that I'm doing it is like for them, like the, the middle of the night, night yeah. or like in the morning on a Tuesday. And yeah. so all the people on there, they're like neats and like dropouts and stuff like that, or people who work midnight like radio yeah. shifts. And so to them, they're really they're kind of the rejects of Japanese society. I kind of realize. <laughs> and so they're really good at that at ex- accepting people who are different because i mean you know they know uh, what it's yeah, like yeah. to be rejected and yeah. so they actually will accept me a lot and i mean they'll still be impressed but they'll actually not really care because they're like yeah every like there's a lot of weird ass people in this uh, world i but. see yeah they're more used to yeah yeah and so i actually yeah. really like talking on scotch on because i get to have that i can make real connections that kind yeah, of feels it's easy like, to fit in i guess like yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i've only been on there a few times and i haven't been on there recently but yeah if you ever go on there and have a bad experience, I encourage you to try again a few times. Of course, there's a <laughs> some weird, weird people on there, but there's some cool people on there too. Man, I went on there once when I was I was having one of my like really cocky stages, and um, <laughs> I I went on there once about I think it was probably the first time I tried speaking, and I got like oh, it was terrible. <laughs> it just yeah, went so badly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, talk- especially if if you go on to they have like kaigis, which is where a bunch of people who barely know each other just go yeah, into this I went group into one of them. And so, you know, they have, in, in Japanese, there's like nori, right? It's like, yeah. you got to read that atmosphere yeah, and yeah. like know what's like, what's going to be funny, what's appropriate to say at what time and all this stuff. And yeah. so keeping up with that is really difficult. Yeah. Like that's, that's when you realize that, oh shit, I still suck. Cause it's like, in ja- there's like two different conversations happening at the same time for Japanese people. There's the surface level conversation, what they're saying. And then there's like the between the lines, like power dynamic and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And learning to read that is I think one of the, the truly most difficult parts of mastering Japanese. Yeah, yeah. That's something I haven't really thought about until recently, that that is the case. Yeah. Because it is... I mean, you, yeah, you don't really have a chance to notice that until you until get the you surface level stuff down. Yeah, yeah. And it's not really until you sort of start actually talking to real native speakers, I think, until you notice that kind of, you know, because yeah, yeah, through yeah, TV like... and stuff, it's it's all scripted, and, you know. But, yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah. I, I know it's like, that's why uh, I'll talk about this later if you ask me about what media I like. But I think Terrace House 
is most the best resources for learning Japanese it outside is. of Japan because it's actually real. Yeah, and you can see this power dynamic stuff happening. Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. I was just watching this episode uh, yesterday of the original season where there's this uh, there's this one guy who's been in Terrace the oh so basically if you don't know Terrace House it's like it's a reality show where they just take six like three guys and three girls they put them in a house and they just film them all the time and there's yeah. no script or anything yeah and. There's this one guy who's been in there for a long time, and he always he wants a girlfriend really, really bad. But <laughs> yeah. he's like beta as fuck, and no one like no no girl likes him. <laughs> it, he, he does uh, his his baito is um, is a gardener or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's and he's like, and, and the yeah. rest of the people are going in there like models. <laughs> and he's trying to get with them. And it's like, dude, give up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he tries to get with a girl from AKB48. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? Mate, what are you doing? But, but uh, one of the, like, uh, he's, but, so the point I was watching yesterday is already, he's been in there for a year. He's, like, been in there longer than anyone else. And uh, and this girl comes in and she's like, I like guys who aren't popular. I like guys who normally are bad at getting chicks. And he's like, yeah, I, I really like him, Tetsu, that that guy. Uh, and yeah. and then Tetsu finds this out and then he is, like, so psyched. He's like, he's like finally, my time has come. <laughs> and then later... Like, the other members start realizing that she doesn't actually like him. She just thought that it would make herself look good if she pretended to like him. Because she's, like, on TV and stuff like that. And and you and and you realize that all the other members are having this, like, below-the-surface, like, exchange of, like, are you serious right now or are you fucking? Like, is that what you really think? Or are you just, like, bullshitting right now to look good? And, and they're actually, like, understanding this. And for me, that would have went right over my head if it wasn't for the comedians who like narrate what's going on right or because yeah. in the show oh, yeah, once an got... episode they'll pause they'll go to this panel of uh of celebrities who basically just comment on the show and they explain the power the invisible power dynamic yeah yeah and if, and it makes me realize like oh shit i would have missed all of that if it wasn't them just explaining it at, like breaking it down yeah, one yeah, by yeah. one that is and so that's why I, actually yeah now that you mention it that is a very good point because i've been watching it a lot recently as well and yeah going whenever there's those moments happen when it goes back to the comedians and they start talking about what has just happened. I'm like, I never thought of that. Like, that's an interesting point of view. And then as you go, like, they, they go, they sort of um, guess what's about to happen, don't they? They sort yeah, of go, oh, yeah. this could happen or this could happen. And as you keep on watching, that usually ends up happening and you're like, Damn. <laughs> yeah. Like, how did they know that? <laughs> like, so yeah, I, I get what you yeah, mean. Yeah, that have- yeah, that ability to read people and, and speak this invisible language of, of yeah. kuki o yomu. Yeah, 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 and yeah. so I think, I mean, to an extent, that's probably really difficult to train outside of Japan. because yeah, I think you probably got to get a lot of conversations in with natives. That's probably Yeah, yeah. And cool. also not just one-on-one conversations, but like but be in a group of yeah. Japanese people and, yeah. and see that, that happen. And so, I mean, that's kind of something where I'm not too focused on it right now because i'm i think if i eventually go to japan i'll put a lot of effort into it now and there's still yeah. more technical aspects of my ability that i can train where i'm here yeah, but yeah. i'm always just really aware that really that's the most important part of being good at japanese because the only people who speak japanese is japanese people right yeah so your ability to successfully communicate with japanese abil- uh, people your ability to make them uh like you to say things that they find interesting and that th- to say that like actually be someone who they want to talk to is pretty much the definition of being good at Japanese, right? Yeah, yeah. And when it, when it comes to that, this ability of like basically social Japanese social skills is the number one most crucial it's, ability. Yeah. yeah, you definitely can't neglect that. And I definitely am very aware that that's my biggest weakness and something that I'm probably going to have to put when I go to Japan work a lot on and probably go through many awkward, painful experiences to get there. <laughs> But well, that's fine, but, as long as you, yeah, as long yeah. you get there in the end. And, yeah. So yeah, you are aiming for a native level speaker, right? That is like or that kind of level you're aiming for. Yeah, yeah. Native, well, I mean, one speaker. of the one of the things you realize as you get more and more fluent, and I'm sure you've you've already thought of a lot about this yourself, but there is no such thing as native level because every right. every yeah. native speaker is at a different level. Yeah. And if you, yeah, I, go ahead. I was gonna say I had a, an issue while, a while back, and I was like. Right, I can sort of understand most of Japanese. And like by this point, I hadn't really spoken much, so it was really stupid of me to even think about this. But um, I was like, oh, you know, I'm better than, say, a five-year-old, which obviously <laughs> I wasn't because I couldn't speak better than a five-year-old, but I could understand more. I, you know, I had a bigger vocabulary. So I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm better than a native five-year-old speaker, <laughs> which is stupid to even think that for a start when I look back on it. But um, 
but yeah, you know, you, obviously a five-year-old native speaker is not going to be the same as uh, an eighteen-year-old native speaker, and an eighteen-year-old speaker is not going to be the same as a sixty-year-old native speaker. It's, they yeah, are yeah, and it, it, like it, if if you take a voice actor or an NHK announcer, they're going to be much better at exactly, projecting yeah. their voice and speaking in a nice way than yeah, a guy yeah. up the street. And if you take like a novelist, they're going to be much better at writing Japanese than the average person. Yeah. You know, and they're going to have a huge vocabulary, and it's just yeah, yeah. And so I I kind of I use the word native level kind of just like I use the word fluent because yeah in reality it means pretty much literally nothing yeah. but it's still like a convenient word that so means really of, good yeah you know yeah, yeah I know what you mean yeah because at the same like I've been thinking about fluency and like the definition of it recently and I kind of don't like using it but at the same time you kind of have to because it's kind of there's no real way yeah, to yeah, sort of, it's, you know, yeah it's like a nice placeholder you need something to to, to have a placeholder yeah. I wish there and the thing is is that you can't even really make a more detailed more accurate system to measure ability because there's like so many different aspects of ability yeah. right like I, yeah. I feel like it's like when you look at like a, a video game uh like a walkthrough guide and for each character it has like that like hexagon with all the all like like attack defense mana yeah, and yeah, yeah. it has the thing it's like that except there's like 50 different sides to the to the yeah to the it's sh- like it's like deck. times times 100 <laughs> like yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. and they're all kind of independent from each other so yeah. it, you can't just say who's better or who's worse when you get to a certain level it's yeah. like because it's like people it's like hey do you think you're better than dogen i'm like i don't know i don't know how good dogen is in like all these different little things yeah, like exactly, just from watching yeah. the scripted videos you know like, yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> but th- but basically i think it is a kind of landmark to get to the point where you could talk to a Japanese person on the phone for like more than 10 minutes and they wouldn't the thought that you weren't born and raised in Japan wouldn't cross their mind. But in reality, that's mostly uh, has comes down to your accent. Yeah. Like because even native speakers, they make uh, grammatical mistakes a lot and they correct it right after or yeah. sometimes they even don't. But what really like unconsciously gives you that sense of, oh, yeah, he's just like me. He's just as good as me is is really the accent. And so yeah. I definitely want to to continue to improve my accent, like continue to polish up my pronunciation and my uh, and especially my pitch accent because that's my biggest weakness yeah. right now. Uh, uh, how, and it gets a point. I was going to say, how are you getting on with that? Because um, I remember we spoke about it probably it's got to be more than a year ago now, and I remember you first sort of getting into it, and you seemed really like excited about it, and I was like, oh, maybe I should learn it as well. But then I was like, oh, I just focus on my sentences for now, and I won't bother. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I do think that in in hindsight, I wish that I would have started earlier, but I also wouldn't recommend it to to total beginners or people who haven't reached like at least a basic level of fluency. Again, there's that word fluency, but it's like because (laughs) pitch accent is kind of uh, if you try to learn pitch accent before you actually understand Japanese, that's like trying to learn to run before you walk. Right. Because yeah. Because the thing is, is that if you think about theory and practice, right, like if you just read how Japanese pitch accent works in a book, that's just theory, yeah, right? Yeah. You don't actually know what it sounds like and how it plays out in reality. So, yeah, you have to learn the theory so that you have you know what to look for when you're studying the real Japanese. But the real knowledge of what Japanese sounds like always has to come from real Japanese. Yeah. You can't you can't read how, how to because if you could just read how to how to speak in a book and speak, then people who are born deaf would be able to sound like native speakers. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and so you're not going to be able to hear the pitch accents in real Japanese if you can't even understand it yet. No. And so really, there's no point in worrying about it early on. And it's actually just going to get in the way. It's another thing that's going to bog bog you down, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking as well. But but the thing with what me studying it now is that, I mean, it's a much trickier issue than I ever imagined when I first started. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, when you think about it. I never put any conscious effort into my pronunciation, ever any conscious effort into my intonation or my grammar or my word choice or anything. I just yeah. immersed. I learned to understand my immersion and then, and then I became able to speak like, naturally. Yeah, yeah. And everything was mostly spot on except the pitch accent. Right. And yeah. so there's something different about pitch accent, right? But yeah. besides everything else. And if you go back and like there's an, there's a video of a Japanese man correcting every pitch accent mista- mistake I make in my uh, I've seen that, yeah. I'll link it uh, below if anybody wants to see it. Yeah, and if you go back and watch that video, what you'll realize is that I make a few very specific types of mistakes. Like, a lot of my picture accents are right, Mm -hmm. but, uh, like, one example is I mix up whether for nouns they're heibang or atamadaka. So, basically, in Japanese, some some nouns are completely flat, and some go down. And so, if you take, like, benkyo, that's, like, flat. But if you take, like, jinse, it goes down. It goes down, yeah. And so... Uh, and this is always the case, right? Jinsei is always go, goes down. Benkyo is always flat. But if in the video, I mix those up. But the thing is, is that I don't mix them up in a consistent way. Like uh, It's just it's, sort of random. like 
yeah, it's random. Like, like one of the mistakes I make in that video is I say, sore de, when it should be sore de. Uh, okay. uh, I go down instead of up. But then in that later in that same video, I say sore de with the correct pronunciation later mm. on. Mm. And so the thing is, is that is that if you take like, uh, for example, a, a German person who speaks English and they make a, a stress accent mistake because English yeah. has stress accent, you know, like the difference between addict and addict is just what what syllable yeah. you emphasize. Yeah. Like I was talking to a German guy who said mistake instead of mistake. He's yeah. Like, yeah, it was a big mistake. But he always says it the same way. Yeah. Like yeah. most kind of, of pronunciation mistakes are are consistent. And so if you correct it once, then you're kind of good. But the yeah. thing, but when you think about the fact that it's almost random for me, it's like my brain doesn't even store that category of information. It doesn't get that pitch accent yeah, and intonation are different concepts. That, yeah, it's just not there. Like yeah, all. yeah, it's a whole feature of the language that my brain never picked up on, and right. it made sense why my brain didn't pick up on it because first of all, it doesn't exist in English. In English, pitch means intonation because yeah. because the accent is stress, and so all every single up and down it has to do with intonation. So if I say hello, hello. It's like they're both technically correct. Yeah. It doesn't change the lexical meaning. Yeah. And the other thing is that in Japanese, pitch accent is unnecessary. Even if you mess up the pitch accents, Japanese people will still understand you just fine, especially yeah. because every dialect of Japanese has different pitch accents and they can talk to each other. <laughs> and the other thing is that uh, it, and even if my brain isn't paying attention to the pitch accents, I can still understand it just fine. Just because although there's some words that like ame and ame, you know, or hashi, mm. hashi, or it's like you have to know they're different only by pitch accent, but mm. you're never going to mix up candy and rain. You know, it's like the context is going to make yeah, it. Yeah, the context is going to give you the, you know, yeah. Like, only yeah, two speakers so, going to understand you whether you say it, whether you yeah. say rain instead of sweets. You know, it's just, they're going to know. Yeah, exactly. And so, basically, there's nothing to tip my brain off that it was missing this whole category of information. Yeah. Because I think how the brain, how the language acquisition center really works is it, it's like, it works through failure, right? Like every every skill we build in in our life is built through failure, right? Like you you want to get good at throwing darts, you try to throw the dart at the target, you'll miss, and then your brain will do a little calculation of how far off you were so they can get closer next time. Yeah. Or same yeah. thing with sh like shooting free throws or something, right? Yeah. And so when what happens when you listen to Japanese is you're trying to understand it and you're not, and that's a failure. And so your brain gets to work, like okay, we're we need to understand this language and we're not doing it, so let's get to work and figure it out. Yeah. yeah. But once you reach that point where you understanding everything that's coming into your ears 100%, your brain kind of retires yeah. in a way. It's yeah. like, okay, cool, we figured it out. And so, like, my brain reached that point without needing to figure out that pitch accent was even a thing. And now it's like, how do I get my brain to realize that it is? Two interesting things about this is that when an American person or an English speaker, sorry, mm -hmm. learns Chinese, they actually don't struggle with tones that much because tones are completely crucial. Right. Yes. For, for speaking. Yeah, it's like if you, if, if you mess up the tones when you're speaking, they're not going to understand you. Mm. And if you uh, if you if your brain can't hear the difference in the tones or pay attention to that, it's not going to be able to, to uh, understand because it's such a crucial feature of the language. And so yeah. their brain figures it out. And the other thing is that when Chinese people learn Japanese, they don't struggle with pitch accent that much when mm. they get good because their brain already has the concept of tone. So it knows that that if you're when you're talking about pitch, it doesn't All necessarily right. mean intonation. It could also mean lexical meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And so although I studied pitch accent theory and it wasn't that hard because I was already fluent in Japanese. And so it's like I learned how the system of pitch accent, I went and I memorized the pitch accent for every word that I know. And I learned to hear it just fine. Like I can listen to Japanese and I can hear it just fine. But the thing is that that's all conscious stuff, mm. right? Mm. My, my unconscious model of the language feels mostly unchanged. And so that's a really tricky issue that uh, is, is kind of still unsolved for, for me at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, so you're trying to get it into your subconscious, like trying to yeah have like, it so that when I, you speak, yeah. it just comes comes to you, like yeah, yeah, like or, or the biggest difference is that like you know how uh, it when someone's make makes a mistake in your native language, it immediately stands out to you like a sore thumb. Yeah, uh, and and it, you just intuitively know that it's wrong even before you have a, t a chance to intellectually analyze it. Yeah, and. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of things in Japanese do feel like that. Like even like if someone messes up wa and ga, it immediately is like, oh, that's wrong. Yeah. Or like, and even some things about pitch accent. Like when I listen to Kansai Ben, I hear so many things. I'm like, whoa, that's weird. That would go down if it was normal, but it went up. Yeah. Uh, but but the thing is, like all the little mistakes I make, like mess, specifically like messing up heibong versus mm -hmm. a tamadaka and stuff like that. When when I listen to someone's Japanese and they make those mistakes, it doesn't stand out to me. In order to notice, I have to be consciously oh, paying attention to it. And right. so if it doesn't, the 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 way to to sound perfect when you're speaking, you you need to have that intuitive sense of what's right or wrong so that you can autocorrect, right? Mm -hmm. Like the reason why someone who goes deaf later in life slowly loses their ability to to 
sound like a native speaker is because they lose the ability to autocorrect. That's the mechanism of sounding native is you, your, your brain's constantly listening to what's coming out of your mouth and making little minor adjustments so that it sounds the way it's supposed to sound. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and if they so, said a mistake, they'd be like, they wouldn't know that they made a mistake, so they can't fix the mistake. Is what exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I can't like, I feel like unless I can make my unconscious mind understand, like, like get to that point where it immediately recognizes pitch accent mistakes because that it, it's included into its model of the language, then mm -hmm. I'm not really going to be able to naturally implement it. You know, like yeah. I like I made a, uh, a video of me reading a novel out loud and I purposely like in my mind, I was thinking about the pitch accents and so I could do it. Right. Uh, but, I see, yeah. but that, that took like 40% <clears throat> of my brain just to make sure I was getting the pitch accents. Right. Right. I see. That. Yeah. I, it I, takes so I don't want to, yeah. yeah, I, I don't want to do that in a normal conversation. And if no. you watch Dogen's videos, he has spot on pitch accent too, but I'm pretty sure that he's also <laughs> in the same position I that I am now. Can imagine. I think I saw him. I think I heard him say that he's um, he practices a lot for his videos and that he goes over them like 50 takes to make sure that it's perfect every time. Yeah, um, that would that doesn't surprise me because. Yeah. Uh, and also, just when you listen to the final result, he overemphasizes pitch accent more than a Japanese person would. Like, okay. uh, it kind of seems like his intonation, because it's like he, he sounds too proper. It's like, right, have you ever li listened to, uh, like, a, a someone who's very good in a second language speaker of English who sounds very good but not quite native because they don't slur the – it's like they'll say, like, yes, and then I went to the store or yeah, something. It's yeah, like, it's, it's like very – proper. It's too clean, like, too – Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so it's too, his sounds too clean like that. But the thing is, is that you're not going to be able to dirty it down like in a native way yeah. unless it, unless it's already in, like naturally intuitive to you. Right. It's like you yeah. can't consciously yeah. get it right. And then on top of that, also consciously dump it down. <laughs> At least sounds pretty unrealistic. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But yeah. So I one see. idea I do have to fix yeah. this and it's pretty out there. But I feel like if you if, if you learn Chinese first and then you learn Japanese, that might fix the problem because you're, okay. if you learn Chinese, your brain will be forced to learn tones because they're necessary. And yeah. then you come back to Japanese and then your brain, then you'll be like a Chinese person. I think there might be something else that's easier than like that. Like, like some kind of, cause basically <laughs> I would like to think so. <laughs> yeah. 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 It sounds like, like a nightmare. You could create some kind of situation in which your that forces your brain to unconsciously realize pitch accents a thing. But I, I I'm, I'm really interested in doing more actual research into like lit, uh, language acquisition and linguistics, the kind of stuff that, because uh, mm. uh, there's a lot of theories into like, what is it that tips off the unconscious mind about what they, they call basically parameters, yeah. like the, the like what could tip off the pitch, pitch accent parameter to the unconscious. So I'm still leaving the possibility open, but I definitely don't think I have a real answer yet. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you're considering learning Chinese then is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. Cool. Blimey. Yeah. See, for the average Joe who just wants to get to fluency would you suggest even bothering with pitch accent yeah i would just because uh i think that the extra awareness will be helpful like i think it maybe if you're like one year into, into learning japanese and you learn the conscious knowledge of pitch accent and then you kind of like just the fact that you know that it'll help you notice more right it, it's okay. kind of like you know how uh if you're, when you're thinking about getting a new car mm. uh, you start seeing that car you're thinking about getting all over the place even yeah. though you never noticed it before yeah it's kind yeah. of uh yeah. I think it's kind of like if you prime your brain to notice something, then you're going to notice it more. And I think that it makes it more likely that, you know, you might you End might up. pick up a little more just immersion. And yeah. also the, the, the thing that I that I really like now, just learn just knowing the theory is that every once in a while you'll be talking to a Japanese person and you'll say a word with like the wrong pitch accent and they'll give you a weird look. But okay. uh, me before, when I was in that situation, I was just fucked. I had to like pull up the kanji on my phone or like explain it with words and then they'd get it. Yeah. And but I felt like I didn't know what was wrong. I was like, I don't know how I just pronounced it. I don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced. And it just had this feeling of being blind. In right, a way. Yeah, but yeah. now I know like, oh, shit, I just pronounced that with a Tamadaka pitch accent, but it's actually Haibong. And uh, and and when you need to, you can also uh, like I can I can consciously I can pull out the conscious knowledge when I need it. You know, like if, if I'm going to say a, a big word. Or something mm -hmm. that's like maybe not as familiar. I'll be like, okay, I'll just put like one extra brain cell and be like, okay, let me just make sure I get that with the right pitch accent. So, I think if you want to be really good, it's definitely worth knowing. But yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. So, I've I can't remember where I've seen you mention it before, but I've, I know you've mentioned using a parent as a way of getting better, like taking your Japanese to the next level of speaking wise. Um, how would you? How did you go about do the, doing this? And would you recommend 
shattering that person. Yeah, I, I think about that there's basically two different categories of immersion that you do. One right. is immersion to uh, improve your comprehension of Japanese, and one is immersion that you do to improve your output. Mm. And so at the beginning, these are going to be the same because you're just trying to understand the language. But like for me now, there's still some, like, I could still improve my listening abilities more. Like, yeah. Basically, when I watch, like, maybe uh, someone speaking, con doing com comedy and Kansai band really quickly, maybe I, my, I can't quite catch all of the sounds. Or maybe when I watch, like, a Yakuza movie from the 80s where they're speaking Hiroshima Ben and it, the sound quality is kind of bad, maybe I, I can't pick it up as well as a native would. Yeah. So if I wanted to improve my listening abilities, that's what I'd go and listen to, right? Right. But yeah. I don't actually want to sound like that when I talk. Yeah. So if I wanted to improve my output, then I would input with stuff that sounds like what I want to output. Uh, I would uh, like I and so that's when I choose a parent and I'd listen to the parent. But the thing is that listening to the parent isn't going to improve my listening abilities, right? Because I already understand it a hundred percent. Yeah, it's going to improve your output, like yeah, yeah. And so with that distinction made, so you probably don't want to be doing input just for output until you're already like at the level where you're outputting, right? So this isn't relevant to anyone who's like still just working on understanding anime and stuff, you know? Like mm -hmm. this is once you're uh like a year and a half to two years or more in and. Out output is actually relevant to you. You actually are are like you can speak already. It's come to you pretty naturally, but you want to you know touch it up and make it sound really good. Yeah, yeah. And okay. so what, once you're there, then yeah, I think choosing a parent is like the best strategy that you can take because there's this quote by Noam, Noam Chomsky that there's no such thing as a language. There's only just different ways of speaking that are more or less similar to each other. Okay. Which because cool. when you think about it, every single person speaks a little bit differently, right? Yeah, like yeah. we all have idiosyncrasies in our speech, yeah. and so instead of thinking of language as some abstract thing that only exists in the heads of people who actually all have a different model, you could just think of it as like, yeah, there's just a mil like seven billion different ways of speaking, or whatever, and so yeah. it's actually easier to just choose one of one person and be like, I'm going to speak like them, because mm. by narrowing down your target, then you know whether when you hit it or not, right? It's a yeah. uh, whether your your success or failure is uh, becomes clear and it's easier to notice things and so you just pick someone just listen to them all the time uh and 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 also it, you got to be careful who you pick so it's like you want to make sure you pick someone who was yeah. probably born and raised in Tokyo unless you want to learn kansai ben yeah uh but be, be beware because kansai pitch accent is even har like more complicated than Tokyo pitch accent I've, and if you mess up uh, the pitch yeah. accent then like and messing up kansai pitch accent is a lot worse than mixing up Tokyo pitch accent. Uh, so be buyer beware on that. Yeah, but if you yeah. so make sure that the person you, like you you choose someone who comes from the place you want to be. Make sure that they kind of mesh with your personality. Make sure yeah. that there's a, a lot of audio uh, media. Like make like pro preferably choose someone who has a radio show. So there's like like hundreds of hours of just them talking, mm -hmm. like to, just to a microphone, so that you have like real high quality unadulterated. Uh, them talking unscripted it has to be unscripted because you have to hear all the verbal verbal flaws and the ums and ettos and all the stuff like that right, okay, yeah. uh, and then also like i choose someone who is a comedian because i wanted to know how to be funny in japanese i chose okay. someone named ijui hikaru which is he's kind of like an intellectual comedian uh and he has a radio sh and he has a radio show that's been going on forever so there's like billions of so hours of plenty of content talking. yeah 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 and so then i would just like l i listen to him all the time Try to just notice as many idiosyncrasies of of his speech as you can. Like, what words does he use a lot? What uh, what like intonation patterns does he use a lot? Mm -hmm. And then just try to imitate him, right? And you might not actually sound anything like him, but you'll probably sound better than you normally do. Yeah. And if you just imitate him enough, that can become your new norm, in a way, you know. Yeah, yeah. So when you've when you're at this level, say after two years, you'd say shadowing. Shadowing yeah, a, yeah, a and I, so yeah, so, so shadowing it can be like yeah, can be a practice that that helps you as okay, cool. like I would also just listen without trying to shadow and also just try to pay attention to the yeah, stuff. Yeah, but then you can al also shadow, and I think yeah, that's a good way to uh, to like get into the okay. the character. Cool. Yeah, but yeah, shadowing yeah. before you're fluent, I think, is a waste. Of time. Yeah, I think it's a waste of time too. I, I think if anything, it could just it just ruin your accent and the way you'll sound. Yeah, it just yeah. ruin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because cause it's like you can't hear the sounds yet anyway, so you can't actually tell whether you're exactly. you're hitting yeah. it or not. Yeah, so you're, you're just like going to be one of those people at karaoke thinking that they're, they're they sounding great when they're singing and that they're right on there with the recording, but really they sound cringy because yeah. they suck. Yeah, yeah. Quick side question: Have you ever tried kar karaoke in Japanese? Tried what? Karaoke in Japanese? Oh, I know, I haven't. <laughs> you haven't. Okay. <laughs> 
Let's just say I've tried it and it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, well, I mean, I well, because it's one of those things where it's like for for because it's one of the rare situations where it's embarrassing for Westerners but not embarrassing for Japanese people. Kind of like going in the yeah. onsen. Yeah, right, where it's like normally yeah. Japanese people are really embarrassed, but for me, I suck at singing, and so singing in front of other people is like the most embarrassing thing for me. Yeah. But they don't care. They're like, yeah, no, I yeah, they don't care at all. Do they? They, they think it's great, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so yeah, that's awesome because um, that's probably the next stage that I'm going to do because I haven't yet thought about doing that. It's only recently I thought, you know, actually getting a parent and sort of focusing on one sort of way of speech. Like, yeah, it almost goes know. into the realm of acting, you know? Yeah, because because yeah. I mean, you Japanese people. You basically are an actor, right? You're like a British person trying to do it, uh, an American oh, yeah. character. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, and the one thing I will mention as well is obviously, you were saying obviously pick someone that's close to your personality. So yeah, um, yeah. lots of different ways of saying things in Japanese. Um, for example, like a gay person might put a different um, <laughs> ending on a sentence, right? Uh, and they might sound slightly slightly gay. So you obviously don't want to shadow someone like, like unless, unless you're gay, then go for it. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what and I mean? I mean, even... Even just like, it's like if you're not a very charismatic guy, but you choose some super charismatic, outgoing Japanese guy, it's like it's yeah. probably not going to work no, it's not, that well. No. Okay, so yeah, I've, you went to university, right? And you studied Japanese, isn't that, is that <laughs> Yeah. Yeah? In 2015, 2015, I went to university. How long was that for? Did you... uh, only for, well, so actually what happened was uh, I was at university for like a year and a half or maybe almost, or or maybe even two, yeah, maybe if it was two full years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then right around the time I made that three hour video, I took some time off from school because that was when I was starting to be like, do I really want to do Japanese for the rest of my life? It was like what I started to wonder, like, okay, I'm getting this Japanese degree. Is that going to do me any good or whatever? And so I didn't I don't think of it as dropping out. I just thought of it as I'm I'm going to take a few semesters off. Yeah. And uh, and I haven't gone back to school yet. And I probably will in the near future or maybe like within the next year or two, just because it's like I already have. Uh, three fourths of my degree done. I only have like one yeah, year you left. Yeah, as well finish it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'll probably go and finish that soon. But as of now, it's like I've I've spent two years at college. I went to community college for the first two years and then transferred, or maybe like a year and a half. I don't know. Well, uh, and also I didn't take a full load because I hated school. So that's why I've gone two years, but I still have like a year left. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't understand how it works in America, so I want to have a clue. But fair enough. And you you did what did you study? You, did you actually study Japanese or did you study like Yeah, I did. No, I studied okay. Oh, okay, when I went to school, I thought I was going to study psychology. Right. Uh and so I signed up for psychology and then they told me when I, when I went there they're like, "Hey, we have a super good Japanese program." And I was like, "Really? I'm already pretty dang good." <laughs> and they're like, "No, no, no, it's like really legit and stuff." And so I was like, "Okay, well maybe I can just do like a double major and then that'll be good and it'll be like a free they, it'll be free, pretty much. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I took a, like a placement test, and they put me into the hardest level. And I, and and I remember there was like an actual interview, 100 percent in Japanese. Yeah. And and she, and and she was like, "Okay, you're yeah, you're good. We'll put you in the hardest level." And I was like, "There's a level like with people my like, as good as me, really?" <laughs> like, and I was really shocked because I was like, "How could that be possible?" <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> and they're like, and, and, but, "But that teacher, she was kind of a bitch. She's like, oh, dude." Don't get cocky. Like, yeah, you're, you're, we have a level for you. Calm down. Uh, so, uh, yeah, she put me there. And so then I started taking psychology classes and the Japanese classes. And I hated the psychology classes, mostly just because I hate school. Right. Like, I like psychology. I want to learn more about it. But I realized that, like, if I take it at school, that means, like, reading a bunch of boring papers and yeah. writing a bunch of papers and doing all these stupid labs. And I just hate school. I like re- learning on my own. Yeah. And so it was kind of like, okay, I just need a fucking degree. So I'll just do Japanese because it'll be easy and I'll learn psychology on my own. (laughs) So I switched to just Japanese, which maybe wasn't such a great decision. But at the time, I was just like, I was, oh, that's all I I could deal with because I really fucking hated school. And so I was in the Japanese class. I was that hardest Japanese class they put me in was easy as hell. Like I was by (laughs) far the best person in the class. And there was a bunch of people who were half Japanese or full Japanese, but they were, uh, like, born in the U.S. Oh, I see. So they you never actually learned it. Yeah, yeah. And there was actually, what was cool was when I was in high school, there was, uh, there was a, a few Japanese kids like that. And every mm. Sunday they had to go to Japanese school for, like, nine hours where they learned kanji and, like, Japanese math and stuff like that. Yeah. And when I first started learning Japanese, I went to that school and I'm like, hey – like, and this was before I knew about Ajat. I'm like, hey, can I, can you let me join your school and just, like, put me with the kindergartners so I could learn Japanese? And they're like, oh, uh, no, dude, you're white. And I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, oh, fuck you. And, uh, and I always saw those Japanese kids, like, sitting at the lunch table speaking Japanese. And I wanted to go talk to, like, I wanted to be there so bad. And uh, two of those Japanese people were in my Japanese class here. 
oh. except I was way better than them at reading kanji. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it finally felt like, oh, yes, I get my revenge. Uh, <laughs> and the classes were easy as, as crap. They were actually in Japanese, but it was the okay. teacher would talk to us like we were in elementary school. Right. And yeah. all the texts were like super easy. It's like we would read like one chapter out of a bunch of books. Like we read one chapter of, of Norwegian Wood by Munakami Haruki. Okay. And I was like, what the fuck? Like. We're not going to read the whole book? Like, what's the point of reading just the first chapter? Like, <laughs> but, so it's yeah. like English class, but ten times easier. Yeah, yeah. It was okay. like, there was like vocab and vocab tests and stuff. And uh, I remember just the other day, I found this picture of, because in Japanese, kanji was simplified after World War II. And I went through a phase when I was at college where I thought that old Japanese was really cool. And so I knew all the old kanji and all the old kana. And on one of the vocab tests, I wrote all the kanji in the old, like, <laughs> and, and like the teacher, like, only the ones that had the old kanji got marked wrong. And I had, they were all right. And then I went to the teacher and be like, no, 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 look, this is technically correct. And then I got the credit for it. So I just have a picture of that paper where it was like first marked wrong and then, for, and then marked up, right. I got to put it on my Twitter, but <laughs> that is yeah, awesome. So I, I had last, uh, cause, but the weird thing is that no one thought it was that strange that I was so much better than everyone else. It's like, I, they just accepted that I was a genius or something when, I mean, right. in reality, I'm not a genius, right? I just did AJAP. Right. Like no one was like, Hey, how come you're so good? What can I do to be good like you? They kind of just put, it's like yeah. Katsumoto talked about this where it's like, he, he learned Japanese because he wanted to prove that any old schmuck could do it, right? Yeah, yeah. But then once he learned Japanese, everyone started saying, oh, I'm not smart like you. I can't do it. Where it was like in order for people to maintain their sanity, I guess in their, in their mind, they had to like put me in like a separate box. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't have to compare themselves to me. Yeah. And so, there's also the part that people just don't care that much. Like Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's the other thing, too. Yeah, yeah it's like, because yeah. They, I've had a similar experience. Like I did classes as well. I mean, they were a lot easier. And I was a lot worse a level back then. I wasn't even able to speak Japanese at that point. It was probably like, I don't know, a year in. Um, when I, well, I did them originally in the first year of uni, then I dropped them. And then I did them again the second year, uh, second year just to get free credit because I was like, you know, it'd, yeah. be, it'd be easy, why not? Um, and I had a similar experience. Like people would be like, oh, Matt, you're so good. You know, you're, you're so good at this. But no one really cared as to why. Like, yeah, yeah. no one would ask you, no one would, yeah, one thing I really thought at this period of my life was that the difference between an age adder and a normal normal language learner is that a normal for to a normal language learner, Japanese is like an app that runs on their phone and their uh, of and their phone's running in English, right? It's like their yeah. operating system is English and then Japanese is like a little <laughs> program that they that they close that open up for 2 hours a day and then close. Yeah, but yeah, for yeah. a language learner, or I mean for an age adder, you're trying to learn how to how to dual boot, right? Yeah. In two languages, like fundamentally like like, no one in my, my Japanese class spent their leisure time in Japanese, right? It no. was like as soon as they finished their homework, it was back to English land. Yeah. The other thing about uh, being at college was there was a lot of foreign exchange students from Japan. Ah, uh, that's good. Yeah. And hanging out with them was, I mean, <clears throat> mixed mixed bag of experiences. But <laughs> there was a lot of really positive experiences just because, like, there was a lot of, you know, weeaboos at my school trying to learn Japanese, trying to hang out with the Japanese kids. <laughs> but the Japanese kids didn't want to hang out with them. Uh, because, obviously. Because they didn't want to speak English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They would just hang out with other Japanese people. But I actually like got to hang out with them and stuff. And it was really cool. And everyone kind of liked me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so for a while, it was just I, – I finally felt like, man, this was what my my whole life was leading up to. This was what all those years in isolation were for. Yeah. Like so I, I could be the, the one sparkly guy gene, you know, who, who's really good at Japanese. And <laughs> Japanese people would like quiz me on kanji and stuff and I would always know all of it. And it was, it was like really cool. Uh, and then, I mean, eventually it did get to the point where I realized that I was still just, I was just a cool, funny guy gene. But at the end of the day, it's like when they wanted to go like do Japanese stuff, they wouldn't, it's like, they wouldn't really invite me. It's like, if oh, I, I happened to, if I happened to be there, they would let me come along, Yeah. but they wouldn't go out to invite me because to them, it's like, I wasn't really one of them. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that <clears throat> really started to get to me. And that was when I made my three hour video. And, and I mean, uh, okay. now I realize um, where it's sense. like. <laughs> Yeah, or I mean, it was my own fault because I couldn't, I couldn't kukio yomu, right? I didn't yeah. have that ability we were talking about read, before yeah, yeah. of to to really have the Japanese sensibility and be able to read pin the line. So of course, yeah. that was that was the case. Yeah. And now, I mean, I don't really take it personally, and I and I don't think that it, it's impossible to get accepted. I mean, there's always going to be a little bit of a barrier because of because of my face because I look white. But yeah. I feel like Japanese. If if I did have Japanese sensibilities, 
then Japanese Civil would quickly pick up on that and quickly let me in. The reason they didn't let me in is because I didn't have it. You know, mm. I had the language, but that's really a surface level thing. <laughs> and of course, so, sometimes the just the bullshit, how bullshit the classes were, would kind of make me want to go crazy. But I kind of got used to it. Yeah, I mean, it drove me nuts going to the classes because well, I, I skipped most of them to be honest. But like when you sit down, it's like you know just really simple basic stuff, and you're like almost three or four times better than that level. Yeah, it must have driven you nuts. <laughs> well, the worst part was hearing the other. So in my class, there was like three different oh, types course. of people. Other people be speaking when they. Yeah, yeah I had that there as was well. a. So th- there was the other people who were my age who were, uh, you know, either half Japanese or they're either half Japanese, Japanese but born in the U.S. or Chinese, because because ja- Chinese people <laughs> have a lot easier time learning Japanese. But then there were grad students who had been studying Japanese through the college system for like eight years, and oh, but they were just normal white people. Yeah, and yeah. so of course, although they were like five years older than everyone else, they were the by far the worst in the class, and they were just still like complete like arigato Kusaimas accent, <laughs> and <laughs> like obviously thinking in English and using grammar rules like watashi wa sore ga ski desu, like watashi wa sore ga ski de wa arimasen, and uh, just seeing that was like so cringy every time. I was like, like it's like. People still couldn't do the Japanese R. They would literally be like arigato, and I would be like, "That was one of the first things I found." Yeah, that was like like, really easy to pick up. Like, (laughs) yeah, it was. I I have one recorded just because I wanted to show my friends. Of like, dude, listen to this girl in my class. She's been studying Japanese for eight years through the system, but. (laughs) But I actually had one. I talked to one of my Japanese teachers who was like actually a Japanese woman, like about the input hypothesis and stuff, and explained why I was so good and stuff. And and she's basically like, "Yeah, we know." that what we're doing doesn't work and that's what you have to do good but it's like yeah that's the world we live in but. <laughs> that's amazing that's, yeah i mean i i gotta sometimes i gotta think like i've had thoughts like i all language teachers must know that what they're doing is basically pointless like i don't most of them probably don't see successful students that actually get to a fluent level you know a decent yeah, level of fluency yeah. like and I don't understand how they can keep doing the job, but I guess they're just doing it for the money. Like, that's the only thing that... Yeah, can. I mean, because there is a demand for that, right? It's like... Yeah. like I mean, I talked to my, my high school... My uh, high school Japanese teacher uh, a few weeks ago. I had an opportunity, like, through my brother, who still is in high school. Yeah. And, uh, and we were kind of talking about this, and I was talking about my YouTube channel, and, like, I was trying to not make it awkward that I'm, like, nine times better at Japanese than him, even though he's been teaching Japanese for, like, 25 years or something. Yeah. But... But he he seemed to actually be really self aware, and I was kind of surprised. And he's like, "Yeah, I mean, we're just catering to, I mean, these people who actually don't care about Japanese at all." But but I mean, he he kind of he talked about it like he had this one strand of hope. He's like, "Yeah, but maybe one kid in the class, you know, will will actually be interested in it, and they'll actually like spark some passion, and he'll go on and be like you." And so I was like, "Yeah, fair enough." Like I suppose in that respect, yeah, I suppose yeah. I guess, yeah, I mean, he just thought of it as, like, introducing people to it so that if they actually did yeah. like it, they could go on. And I see, that is a thought, actually, because I do remember, I remember my German teacher back in high school. She was very much like that. She would go through the curriculum because, obviously, it was her job, you know. But she was, I do specifically remember pushing, watching films and stuff in the language. She'd be like, you know, if you really want to get good in your spare time, then go watch some of these films. So I think yeah, they yeah. do know, and... They, and yeah. I mean, and the the other argument too is like like my brother doesn't really care about learning Japanese at all, but he right. really likes anime, uh, and so, right. but the little bit of Japanese that he learned in the class, like, apparently it enhan- enhanced his anime learning experience, like because he still watches with subtitles, of course, but he says every <laughs> once in a while he'll act he'll he'll have times where he realizes that the subtitles are wrong. I can kind of infer what the a- original actually said. You know, right. like whether it's like itadakimasu or whatever. Yeah, and so it's kind of like okay, well, I mean, you can't. I mean, it's like maybe he benefited more from that than taking Spanish for those two years. So, <laughs> Still but obviously pretty. that's a whole different dimension than trying to actually like you know use the language for yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I suppose everybody has different goals as well. It's also you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one of the things I I get I get accused on to to uh, really often recently is like, hey, not everyone has to try to be a be a, be a total god level you know and it's like yeah i do know that and i do totally agree with that it's just like i'm talking to an audience when i speak and you got to remember that and if you're not yeah. part of that audience that's totally cool but yeah. don't get mad at me that i'm that i'm not talking to you specifically yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's totally understandable and totally true yeah yeah so you found university easy was there were there any moments throughout your entire well i suppose in the beginning stage particularly because a lot of people that'll be watching this are obviously in the probably in the beginning stages 
um, that you really struggled with, like, for example, the monolingual transition? Or, or Is there anything that you really thought, Christ, this is hard? And how did you overcome that? Yeah, well, I did find the monolingual transition pretty hard now that you, uh, now that you mention it. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. Because, uh, I mean, RTK... I did a bad job of, and that's probably why I didn't find it hard. <laughs> <laughs> Immersing, I didn't find hard because I had this weird thing where I would, like, convince myself that I was actually understanding way more than I was. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I've done that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I first started AJAT, I watched Ikebukuro Westgate Park, the drama, because that's, like, almost oh, the official AJAT drama. Kasumoto recommends it really strongly. Uh, and I felt like I got it. I was like, yeah, I, did. I missed a few words here and there, but it's like, I followed the plot. <laughs> and I, I rewatched it a couple years later once I actually knew Japanese and it was completely like watching it for the first time. Like I had no I realized like, oh, I didn't know what was going on at all. Yeah. yeah. And and I kinda had this weird like ignorance is bliss type of thing going on. I've but, that, yeah. And I also uh, so yeah, I mean I guess the monolith transition was the first time where it didn't go just perfectly smoothly. Mm. And I I mean if you, I have a video on how to make the monolingual transition, and that's something I had to figure out because Kasumoto just says, you know, like, scold cold turkey. Yeah, just like, do look it. Up a word. <laughs> He's like, yeah, just like, do it. <laughs> it's like, take a word, I'm look it up that. in the Japanese dictionary, then look, if there's any words in the definition you don't know, look those up in the Japanese dictionary and just go down and down and down and down until eventually you, you like get to the bottom. Yeah. And I did that, and I, I had this long, like, like, hierarchy of words that was like 15 words long, and then it was like, it's like okay i found this one word at the bottom like some super word like monogoto monoto koto yeah. or something like that and then it was like okay how do i backtrack that all the way up and it was just like a total insane, brain yeah. yeah yeah and it, it, in my brain it just like couldn't do it yeah. and it wouldn't work and yeah. so a couple times i was like oh well maybe i'm not good enough yet and i went back to doing bilingual sentences for a while and then i came back again and it still didn't work yeah. and so i mean there's two things that really helped me well one is just that uh i got this program Quelbury and all these F-Wing files. So, mm. I mean, I have a, a video on my channel how to do it, but basically it's like you can, there's these dictionary files for the Japanese Japanese dictionaries that you can open up simultaneously in this program called Quelbury. So you can look up a word and you get like six different Japanese to Japanese definitions for the same word all yeah. right next to each other. Yeah. And that was really helpful because every definition is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so the more you have, the more likely it it is that you're going to be able to understand one of them or that yeah, one of yeah. them is going to be... Because if one's too hard, you like, can just find one that's easier. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and there's surprisingly a lot of variance between there the dictionaries. There is, yeah. Uh, and so that helped. But the biggest thing was that I came up with this strategy where I'd look up a Japanese word in the, in the monolingual dictionary, hmm. but then when there was words I didn't know in the <laughs> definitions, then I would look those up in the English dictionary. And then I just learned those. Oh, okay, yeah. So I just go one layer deep. And what I found was that there's like about 200 words that I call dictionary words mm. that they're not used that commonly in everyday Japanese, but the dictionary uses the di them all the time. Yeah, yeah. And they're also extremely abstract, like like kotogara, dekigoto, yeah. like monogoto, jibutsu. It's like, what are the difference between all of these? They're pretty tricky. Yeah, yeah And yeah. so I just learned those through with the English dictionary. And then I found that after I learned those like 200 words, then suddenly the, di uh, the di definitions weren't so hard anymore. And I made the transition. Yeah. And also, there was... Af so after that, there was a period where when I made my cards, they would always be monolingual. Uh, 100%. Yeah. But when I actually was just reading a book and I wanted to know a word like on the go in the wild, I would still use the English dictionary just because oh, okay. it was... It was too slow. It's like I just wanted to know what that word was right then, and and so I did that for like a like a month or two. Yeah. And then after that, I went all Japanese, all the all Japanese dictionary all the time because I had enough practice. Because every day I was making cards, and those were monolingual. I was getting practice. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. You I made just yeah, eventually. Yeah, yeah, and then it wasn't wasn't too too painful. So there was that. Let me think if there's anything else I really struggled with. I mean, one thing I struggled with when I was learning to read was that I was I couldn't. I kind of have OCD and I like couldn't if I couldn't understand something, I couldn't just skip it and move on. Like I'd like just like mull over it for like 15 minutes straight the same sentence. And I would just the idea of skipping something I didn't understand moving on, like just made me yeah. cringe so hard. And so in hindsight, that was like something that really held me back. Like I should have just gotten over it and because mm -hmm. and learn to just skip stuff. Because it's like if you don't understand it after like a couple seconds of thinking about it, it wasn't I plus one. Yeah, which means yeah. it's just it's, too hard for you, and you should just skip it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, just skipping it and finding the stuff that is I plus one, because that's what really makes you grow, is the most efficient way. And so, yeah. for a while, that was like really a big frustration of mine. I was always like dealing with my OCD of, of how it it would take me so long to read just a little bit because of that. 
And yeah. I really emphasize now, like, get comfortable with ambiguity because you're going to be experiencing a lot of it. Yeah, you will. You will ex- like for the for pretty much a year, you're not going to understand much. Yeah, but I mean, um, the interesting thing was at the very beginning, I you understand so little that you can't not. It's like you can't let it bother you. It yeah. like, seems like kind of obvious. But yeah. after yeah. I got to that point where I was understanding a lot of stuff, that was when the stuff that I didn't understand would really start to bug me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. watch out. <laughs> like, yeah. I was watching um, something the other day, and I had a moment where, like, normally my listening's fine. And I had a moment where Winston Churchill does a speech. <laughs> and throughout that speech, I was like, crap, I don't get a lot of this <laughs> and I had to go back over it and watch like watch it with um with uh JP subtitles Japanese subtitles yeah yeah and I I got it with the subtitles but I was like fuck <laughs> yeah I know it really well, annoyed well, me because I was like it, you, yeah yeah you start to identify with with your ability right yeah. you start to feel like me Matt me Matt yeah. not you Matt but yeah. me Matt right. who's who's has perfect listening ability yeah, and yeah. so then those, like, when even in your native language it's like you sometimes you still have to say what yeah. Sometimes when I'm watching even an American movie, I don't understand stuff. But the thing is that in your native language, you always assume it's like it's their problem. Yes. But in Japanese, you assume it's your problem. Yeah. yeah. And so it's kind of I mean, I actually think it's good to have that double standard because it, yeah. it like encourages you to improve. Yeah. Like yeah. whenever there's whenever in doubt, always like assume that it's something a problem on your part. It also is good to, to remember. Like I actually like whenever I watch something in English and I don't understand something, it makes me happy because mm. it makes me just like maybe I'm better at Japanese. Yeah. I- <laughs> <laughs> I had this the other day. I was at work and um, I, 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 I'm, I'm doing like a small delivery driver job, which is great, really great by the way, because I can listen to Japanese all day. But um, yeah, I asked someone, oh, uh, do you know so and so? Do you know if this person's in? I need to give them this parcel. And the bloke said, "Have you tried knocking on their door?" But he said it in such a way that I just couldn't understand <laughs> what he was saying. Like, and he was a native English speaker. He just had a bit of a strange accent. And I was like, "Sorry, what did you say?" And he said it again. I said. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> and then the woman next to me said, "Have you tried knocking on their door?" And I was like, "Oh no, 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 I haven't." And it, I was like, "How the hell did I not understand what he said?" And then I thought, "Oh, maybe you know, in Japanese because this happened every now and then. Oh, maybe I'm not that bad at Japanese, you know." Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny how that happens. Like both yeah. reading and listening. It's like, and or even yeah, when just a word you don't know or anything. It's like because I you. At least for me, and, and it sounds like you too. It's like you, after a certain point, you hold yourself to such a high standard. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that really you don't even fit in your, you can't match in your native language. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think yeah. In terms of stuff that I struggled with, I mean, it, besides the oh, yeah. the kukio yomu stuff that I was talking about before, mm. which I'm still struggling with. That was like until basic fluency. That was the biggest thing, probably. Yeah, fair enough. Cool. Cool. So, outputting, how. When did you start, first of all, and what, how, how did you go about it? Did you, like, f- deliberately practice, like, saying specific phrases, or did you just go for it, like, jump into a, a, a kahi and just freaking go for it? How did you how did you go about that? Well, so, like I said, six months after starting AJ, I went to Japan, and obviously I had to output a lot in Japan, ah, yeah, but that was yeah. mostly, like, you know, the typical think in English, translate how, that into Japanese. How did that go, by the way? Because, so you see, you, you would just translate, like... From, okay, right. So you yeah, wouldn't... I mean, I was pretty good at at pl- being a typical language learner. Like, I was pretty good at using the grammar rules and stuff. I mean, right. of course, I still sucked, but it's like, like I remember we uh, there was one time where we went to this camp, and there was a bunch of Australian kids, that, like an English teaching camp, when I was yeah. in Japan. And I mean, I and part of that was because I had been doing six months of age out already. Actually, that was probably a big part of it. Uh, and of course, I was like, although I still totally sucked, and I wasn't even that close to fluency. I was mm-hmm. way better than everyone else there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I, I would love that ego boost of, like, me just talking to a Japanese person, like, over the shoulder of another guy. <laughs> and, know saying, and even though, like, you might be saying things wrong, like, the guy yeah, doesn't yeah. know, so it's like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And but, I remember, yeah. like, when I wanted to say something, like, when I wanted to say something clever, I would think it out ahead of time. I'd, like, totally, actually, it's coming back to me now. I haven't thought about this in forever. <laughs> but I would, like, I would, like, the night before, I'd, like, plan out a bunch of oh, clever things I could say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And whenever, and I mean, even after, like, when I, just talking to my host family, if there was anything important I had to say, I would, like, plan it out ahead of time and, like, with the grammar and everything yeah, and, like, yeah. mentally prepare a little bit. And yeah. so, I mean, of course I sucked. Uh, and actually, I ha- I recorded a few conversations because I remember, like, my host family would talk to each other or kids at school talk to each other. Yeah. And I and I couldn't know what they were talking about. So I recorded it. So I was like, man, one day when I'm fluent, I'll go back and listen to this and I'll know what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, one of those, I it's like I was still in the room, so they like will kind of uh, talk to me a little bit, and I listen back now, and it was like 
I didn't know. I, I would do that thing where you don't know what they're saying, but you just guess and then you respond as if you did know what they're saying. Yeah. And uh, just kind of make up shit. So, yeah, it was really cringy and bad. Uh, and so when I first got back from Japan, first of all, I wanted to, like, let all those habits kind of die. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to speak for a long time. Yeah. But I also had this mindset of, like, I didn't realize that it was going to take practice to get good at speaking. Yeah. Like, I thought I – because basically all I knew was, was the – the age at website and i was also really young and naive so i kind of just thought that if i got enough input wh- i would eventually become just, like l- literally yeah. native level yeah and zero I, practice yeah and i'm still f- I, up until and well up until i got to like the 18 month sort of stage i was on the same lines as well and then i kind of re- started realizing hang on a minute you have like it's not coming yeah, out as smoothly yeah. as i want it to you kind yeah, of you definitely it's that, still in reality it takes a lot of practice i mean you yeah. can still get like basic fluency right yeah like, yeah yeah just through input, which is amazing when you think about yeah, it. Yeah. But if you want to, to sound really awesome and be really quick and snappy, I mean, you got to build the muscle <clears throat> memory in a way. Yeah. yeah so I do. think of it as input as like you're building up your potential and yeah. then it takes practice to kind of cash in on that potential and turn it into real ability. Right. I see. Uh, and so I kind of th- always and I kind of picked on picked up on that, I think maybe early on. But I just had this mindset of like I want to have I want to get all build up like infinite potential first before I cash in. Like mm-hmm. I want, like you know, I said I talked about immersion for comprehension and then immersion for outputting. Oh, but yeah. And I wanted to just like completely beat the game of comprehension. Like I wanted to understand everything a Japanese person can understand completely, have Japanese sensibilities and everything before I even started speaking practice. Yeah. Just because I mean I think this was because like when you get to to where me and you are right now, you mm. know you realize that there's no end to to the language, yeah. right? Like yeah. there's yeah. always more you could learn. But at the time, I didn't really, I didn't realize that, and I kind of thought that there would be an end. So I was like, okay, well, if there's an end, I might as well get there first. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and so yeah, so that's why I never practiced speaking because it was it wasn't even on my radar because I was like, oh well, I still can't read like like 19th century novels yet, so I, I better do that first. Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, part of that was just because, I mean, I, I was probably intimidated by the idea of practicing speaking, you know, and going through sucking and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, but, even now I'm still very nervous when I actually come to speaking to an actual native speaker because it's just like, I don't want to make a mistake and sound like an idiot. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? It sucks. And uh, yeah. So and I so, totally, I mean, totally get that. So basically, I didn't, I mean, like I said, I would have the occasional opportunity to output, like when I had that random job of guiding Japanese people downtown. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was like the first time I had sp- actually spoken mm. in a long time. And and it, and I did, I did have basic fluency. So I was shocked, right? Because I hadn't practiced at all. And I was like, fuck, Katsumoto was right, dude. It works. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, and probably I wasn't as good as I remember I was now that I think about it. Cause it's like, you know, there's a Dunning-Kruger effect. So I, I, I feel like yeah. in my mind, my memory is that I was awesome, but probably in reality, I was just like <laughs> good at better, better than I was in Japan. And so that felt like I was amazing, but I yeah. would cringe if I heard it now. Yeah. But, uh, but it wasn't, so I didn't really output regularly until I went to college in 2015 because, and cause then I had all those foreign exchange students. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so talking to the foreign exchange students, like did help me a lot. But the interesting thing was in my, I still had the mindset of I'm not doing speaking practice yet. I'm just building my potential. Like right. speaking was just like a like a little fun thing I did on the side, even yeah. though I was speaking Japanese almost every day and I was getting a lot better. <laughs> but but I guess it was easy for me to not judge myself on the output because it, in my head it was like, no, I'm still not in my comp- my final form. Like, this is still my, <laughs> my incomplete form. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, but it, I did get better from speaking and, and like I would get some feedback. And like I found that when I was close to a Japanese person, he would give me a lot of feedback. Yeah. Uh, just because it's like, you know, if you're talking to a native speaker and mm-hmm. they make a mistake and they're your friend, it's like hard not to correct them. Yeah, right? it is. Like, yeah. But if you it, it, yeah, like, like it, if you're like really close, then it's a lot. Yeah, it's not yeah, too yeah. bad. But yeah, if you're just like a normal, if you're just like a friend, like. Yeah. And so Japanese, I think it was kind of that mentality when they, I'd say a word and they like even just pitch access stuff and they'd be like, dude, it's it's not this, it's this. Yeah. And uh, and they're or they'd be like, 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 that little ne. Yeah. Like, yeah. The yeah. reading like, back oh, and then, it, the yeah, and of course it would that would hurt so bad, whatever <laughs> it happened. But, but of course I'd be thankful for it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so I mean, yeah, I never really until kind of recently did I, I I finally I'm like, okay, well I better cash in on my potential finally. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still and especially with like the pitch accent stuff when I more realized that was the biggest thing where it was like I realized like oh I this is gonna take work to actually get to that uh, yeah, yeah. that point. Yeah. Uh, but all, even like uh, I never yeah I never really 
did I, I always had a plan of what I would do when I was ready to cash in on my potential. Like, okay, I'd get a parent. I listen to the parent all the time. I'd like mm-hmm. record myself speaking in audacity for 15 minutes every day and listen back to it and like re- retry it. I'd like Skype with Japanese people like m- m- multiple times a week. Uh, and then I'd listen back to the conversation I had with them and like try to find out where I can improve. Yeah. It's like if I actually did that, of course I would get way better at speaking. Mm-hmm. But I, I still like never really fully went into that mode yet because I still feel like, oh, well, there's it's like I could still get better at you reading. Still get better like, first, yeah. 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 I could still build up more potential. Plus, I don't have plans of going in Japan anytime soon. So it's not really that real. It's, not, it's like yeah, when, I, yeah, yeah. when I need to speak Japanese, I already I'm like good enough. Like I had actually an interview in Japanese uh, a couple weeks ago because in August, these Japanese kids are coming for two weeks to uh, like for a foreign exchange just in the summer. Oh, okay. And so I, I, it was going to be like kind of like the chaperone of like every every day they have a different they go to like a different tourist site. And so it was someone just to like lead them, like be the, oh, okay, the group yeah. leader yeah. of like these like 40 kids. Yeah. And and you needed to know Japanese and English, obviously. And so it's like I, I went and uh, like someone like got my name through someone else. And I went went into like the travel agency and it was like the interview was 100 percent in Japanese. And uh, and of course, it's like I sounded like way better than any gaijin they have ever heard mm-hmm. so to them they were of course super impressed and yeah. and i'm and also it's like they gave me some text like a paragraph to read out loud i read out loud no problem and so yeah. I, and I got the job and so it's like i'm i'm good enough when i need to it's just not at that like like get yeah. confused for a native level that i want to be at eventually yeah yeah i, I get what you mean yeah you just want to you, you kind of want to keep inputting to really really perfect. to get more potential because yeah, the thing is that more and just, the more potential you have the easier time you're going to have sounding good when you do cash in yeah yeah so it just seems that. like the most efficient way in the long run yeah 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 because i i personally think that i output i've started out putting too early and that has probably gonna have a, an effect well it has had an effect on my speaking level but i think i really wish i would have waited a, really i mean it's it's it's, it's I mean, hard I'm to sell people input. because so, so then you, when you say it's hard to sell people like, yeah, you're not going to be able to speak for two years. Yeah. But, people but, are like, like, oh, you, but I want yeah, to. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, wow. well, I mean, once you start age adding, you, you, your desire to speak quickly, slowly, quickly goes away because you realize like, oh, but if I speak now, I'm going to suck and I want to actually be good. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but the I reality started. is that, yeah, the longer you wait, the better you're going to sound when you do cash in. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the reality. Well, we spoke about this, I think, um, oh, just a minute ago, but have you felt any effect on your English since you've started? I mean, well, we spoke about this before we actually started the, started the interview, actually, didn't we? Um, but Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is it's hard to separate, because for a while, I, I felt like, oh, I suck at English. Like, because basically, you know, we were talking about, yeah, before, how we hold ourselves to such a high standard in Japanese, right? Like, yeah. I want to know every word. I want to. I don't want there to be a single word I don't know in this book. Yeah, yeah. I want like I want to like sound completely articulate and never have to be like using like buts and ums too much or, or like etols and all that stuff in my yeah, speech. Yeah. But and so when I view my English through that light, I realize like oh I kind of suck like for a native speaker. Yeah. Like yeah. when I open up a book, there's words I don't know all over the place. Uh, I I stumble over my words all the time. I'm there's all these weird like i suck at spelling <laughs> that's a I mean, <laughs> yeah that's the thing that i've noticed uh, uh myself and so it. yeah and but then the question is have i gotten worse at Jap- at english since i started japanese and for a while i thought the answer was yes because i would be speaking and a japanese word would pop into my head mm-hmm. and i couldn't think of a good way to say it in english i mean i would i would work around it it wasn't detrimental but it would be annoying yeah. and it felt like that shouldn't happen yeah but what i realized is that that's not an issue of me getting worse at English. It's just an issue of like, because basically, you know what, when you really pay attention to it, we don't think in any language. We kind of, no, our just, brain just thinks in pure meaning, yeah. right? Or pure, pure concepts. It's like when you're hungry, you can know you're hungry without going like, like mentally like, Oh, I'm hungry right now. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, you just, you just know it's like a direct knowing. Yeah, yeah. And so really what happens is we have this direct knowing we have a thought then we put it into language then we say it the other person hears it and they convert it back into real raw meaning and it's like if you've ever had a long text conversation like a long just conversation on chat or on text Mm -hmm. and you stop and think and you realize like wow all i was doing was like exchanging these random symbols like right like i was just writing these random flat symbols and getting them back but it actually feels like you just talked to the person right yeah yeah and that's because you weren't just reading those symbols you were mm-hmm. converting it into something that has real meaning to you you know yeah yeah and so i realized it's like uh when you only when you're monolingual and you only know one language then basically all the all the thoughts that you're gonna have are gonna be really fitted to that language because 
it's like you you get your thoughts through the language, right? Yes. Yeah, so you, you think you, yeah, your thoughts will be English like if you only speak English, and so yeah. it'll be very natural for you to speak English because the thoughts you have the first time will will be very easily converted into English. And of course, sometimes we have emotions that are hard to describe and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's very smooth. Yeah, but yeah. if you introduce an, a, an entirely different language like Japanese into the mix, your brain now has like a different source of gaining direct concepts or direct like ideas. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of Japanese kind of ideas that they don't have in English, like yakugide, hmm. right? Or or like uh, a lot of stuff, like yahari. There's like just hmm. little things where it's like you start to incorporate those into your thought process, but there's no real equivalent in English. And so it's not that I'm actually worse at English. It's that my, my thinking process itself has become less English-like. And yeah. so, therefore, it's harder to converse in, in English. But my actual English itself hasn't gotten worse, I realize. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, it's just the fact that you you now have another source of, I guess, information to sort of think in, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, like, if yeah. you wanted to say something, sometimes the first, your brain automatically goes to Japanese instead of English first. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It, and it's because there are no equivalents in the language, right? Yeah, like, yeah. May, may, everything is a little bit different so maybe the one that you're really feeling is the japanese version of it and saying in english means kind of like sacrificing a little bit of what you really wanted to yeah. express yeah because it doesn't the english version doesn't quite have all that meaning in it whereas the japanese version does yeah i get that yeah yeah and the other thing is that it's like if you only know english every any single piece of language that exists in your head you can say and you'll be understood yeah. So yeah. you don't have to really filter that much. It's like, yeah, yeah, if you're talking to your parents, you don't want to use cuss words, but but it's like mostly everything that you could say, you can say. Yeah. But if you, you can't know just two start languages, shouting out yeah. Japanese to your parents because yeah. they're gonna be yeah, like, it's what the like, fuck are you on about? <laughs> yeah, because when you really think about it, it's like now half the words you know, you you can't say, and so yeah. you have to constantly be not saying things that you know, yeah. and so you you have to have this filter, and so it kind of made me realize that there's probably a meta ability of keeping languages apart in your head that you have to develop separately from just languages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I kind of feel like, like, because before I used to not care about English and I used to only want to be good at Japanese. But now I feel like, like, I mean, if I get really good at Japanese, now I'm just a normal Japanese person. And mm-hmm. there's nothing cool about that. Yeah. What, what's really cool is to be the equivalent of two monolinguals in one person. Yeah. yeah. Which I actually took a class on bilinguals in at college. And it turned, and I learned that actually that's very, very rare. Like, pretty much the only people you'll find who are the equivalent of two monolinguals in one are, like, simultaneous interpreters and stuff like that. And most people who grow up bilingual, like, because you know there's parts of the world where it's normal to be bilingual. Like, if you're on the borderline between two countries or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Europe's but very yeah, for yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you're more like the equivalent of 1.5 link monolinguals in one. Yeah. Because there's you a s- lot of things you only know in one language or the other. Yeah. You kind of speak five languages, but on a lower level. Like, instead of yeah, speaking yeah. five languages uh, all to, like, native level, you just, just sort of, like... It's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like polyglots. Like, like, none of the, the... Most of the polyglots on the internet aren't actually that good at speaking <laughs> their languages, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. That's the reality. It's they, like, they're at, like, a low intermediate level or even higher intermediate level yeah, at a yeah. bunch of languages. But, but but it's, like, to actually be the equivalent of two monolinguals in one person is, like, a true achievement. And that's yeah, kind of what yeah. what I am kind of going for now and I think would be a really cool thing to That'd achieve. That would be really cool, yeah. yeah. And awesome. so I kind of feel like a big part of that is the meta ability of keeping them separate uh, and yes. not letting them interfere with each other, which you have to train separately than just the two languages. And, and I mean, I have some sub ideas how to do that. Like, like, I actually think translating would be a really good exercise because you're forcing yourself to say the same thought. Because, I mean, like I said before, the issue is that your thoughts might only be unique to one language, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if you translate out, you're going to get good at, you know, being able to, to say the same thoughts in either language. Like, you'll get more articulate. You know, uh, you'll yeah, be able to... I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and then so, can you, like, when you accidentally, like, start linking them and then wouldn't that have an effect? Well, I mean, it could. Well, I mean, there are some things that are perfectly fine to be linked. Like, the name of planets, right? It's like... Like, yeah. Passe is Mars, and that's all there is to it. Yeah. But on the other, all the on the more subtle things, when you're actually translating, you're not going on a word by word basis. You're going, you're because you know I just said we think in raw meaning, right? You convert yeah. it into raw meaning first, and you convert that raw meaning back. Mm. So really, it's like the meanings created out of the combination of the words, not the individual words. So yeah. I don't think it would really be that much of an issue. No, I mean, it's, we, not it's nothing like doing translation when you're at a language 101 class yeah. where they're giving you formulas. It, it's more like you, you're you because the conversion is done in the area of raw meaning, not at the level of language. Right. That's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. But but I actually think it's really interesting because I was talking to my brother who's uh, like a competitive fighting game player who yeah. plays uh, like like Street Fighter really seriously. And he was telling me how it's like the same thing where there's there's 
there's some uh, fighting game players who are at like a professional level at different games <laughs> that are very similar to each other, mm. but different. And so they have to build a meta ability to keep them separate and not let them interfere with each other. Okay. And they build that meta ability alongside the actual ability of the game itself, but mm. that it is possible. Like just the fact that my brother told me that it's like, yeah, you could be like at a, like, like this guy Mewtwo King is like one of the best players of the world at like every version of Smash, even though that they're they're different and they yeah. don't interfere. It made me, it gave me a lot of hope. It's like, okay, if he can do that, then I can do what I want to do yeah. with Japanese. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah, I hope that because that would be awesome. Like if you could speak both and just be immaculate in both languages, loves. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the dream. What part of the process for you was most enjoyable? Like. And do you find it boring now? Because it's just so good. Is, is there a point? Like, like Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, so first of all, the, the most fun part was definitely when I was about one year into the process. Like right when I first got back from Japan, mm. because you reach this <clears> point <throat> where you understand a lot of stuff. And so you're like, I remember when I first watched Sword Art Online, yeah. uh, for example, I, I was watching it as it came out episode by episode. And I could I could follow the plot, no problem. Yeah, like yeah. I could tell what was going on, and I actually enjoyed the plot for the plot. Like I remember, the, you know, the episode where it, it's like this, the second half of the season, where he's like in the, they're in the pixie land, and he like battles the boss of the other one of the pixies, and they're like in the in the air, like, and he pulls out the double sword, you know, and like destroys oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember watching that like in Japanese as it came out, and just thinking like, yeah, this is the most badass thing I've ever <laughs> fucking seen. But, <laughs> but the other thing was that there was still a lot of stuff I didn't know, and so like I would. I would watch an episode of Sword Art Online, I'd download the subtitle file, and I'd mine that. Mm-hmm. And then, like, later that day, I'd start hearing those words that I mined, because they're not, they're still relatively common. Hmm. So there's this sweet spot where you know enough where you're, you're not just in, you're not like a baby anymore, like, with every, with this incomprehensible yeah. mushroom. But there's also still so much stuff you don't know that yeah. improving is really easy. Yeah, yeah. And so you constantly, you, you feel your, your, your growth so strongly because you learn a word in the morning, you hear it in the evening. That motivates you to learn more, so you learn more the next day, and then you yeah. hear it again. You make and you get this like positive mini feedback. Leaps, like, yeah, yeah, and that's really it's like ecstasy. It's like that yeah. is yeah. is the best part of AJAP yeah. for sure. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like yeah. you because because you feel like your whole life is now is productive. It's like no matter what you're doing, whether you're in the shower, you like whether you're on a walk or just eating, you're you're going getting closer to your goal each yeah. second. And yeah. so it, you it makes go, oh, your life. Yeah, I got that. that. That's a new word I just understood. Like, yeah. And you just, yeah, it's like literally like your life's an RPG and you're playing it all the time, like yeah. always leveling up. Yeah. Yeah. And that definitely wears off once you start to get fluent. And it does like that, that sense, that thrill definitely wears off. But mm. the trade for that is as it wears off, then your actual comprehension gets so good where you don't need it to be to, for it to be entertaining. It's like it gets more and more. It's like, yeah, I'm just watching this anime because I want to watch an anime. I'm not doing it for Japanese. Yeah. I mean, you are, but it's more just like like I study Japanese history in Japanese and I didn't think of it as Japanese practice. I thought it was like, no, I actually want to know more about this topic. Yeah. And so I'm reading these, I'm just reading these books. And, and so, I mean, it didn't have the thrill, but it's not necessarily boring. It's more just like normal life, like up until yeah. you, you started. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, definitely. I mean, a lot of times I feel like the reason why most age adders want to pick up a third language is because they have this craving for that goal for the golden days period where it was so fun and exciting and exotic yeah. and new. And and I definitely it's like when I started chi- Chinese a couple times, uh, and this was before I had the crazy theory about pitch accent. It was just because I wanted that thrill again. It was like <laughs> I just saw, man, it would be so easy. I could get better every day. Yeah, it'd be yeah, so yeah. fun. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then and then, but with Japanese, it's kind of like, it's like yeah, it's it's not fun anymore. But I'm also still not at that native level yet. I still want to get better. But there's so there's diminishing returns, you know. It's like there's still I, there's still words I don't a lot of words I don't know. Mm. But if I learn those words, I might not see that a word again for like another two years or something. Or and so yeah, yeah. It, it's like I need to keep getting better, but it's so hard to feel the progress that it's kind of not motivating. Yeah, but, yeah. But I mean, like when I discovered pitch accent, that made my Japanese learning so fun again because it was like a whole new challenge, you know. Uh, like now. Okay. It gave me yeah. something to listen for when I was listening to Japanese. Now it was like, can I hear the pitch accents? Can I like notice all, all, all this little stuff? And so, I mean, I think the key to to make keeping it fun is like, because when you want it, when you get to, you know really good, in order to improve, you have to to like focus on one small area. Like you can't you can't spread yourself out too much. So I think like if you choose a small area, like for me, like okay, I'm gonna work on just pitch accents, and you kind of like focus on that. It, you can you can still create an environment where you can see your progress because if you make your target small enough, you know, you'll improve at it yeah, at, a, yeah. at a rate you can feel. So it's like, even if it's like, okay, I want to get better at reading like books written in the major period. It's like, you'll get better at that noticeably if you yeah. practice that. 
Yeah. And so yeah. I kind of I've kind of learned how to make it more fun. But at the end of the day, it's never going to be like that that golden day. No. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So so a lot of people say that tons of reading is uh, a great way to vastly expand your vocabulary um, when learning any language. Do you agree with that? Do you think um, do you think that your vocabulary has improved a lot from a lot of reading? And do you think it has like any effects on listening and speaking abilities in a good way or, or a bad way? Like Yeah, language? this is a really good question. I have a lot to say on this. <laughs> so, of course, reading is a great way to expand your vocabulary because reading is way easier than listening. Yeah. Like, that's all there is to it, is that reading is way easier because you can go at your own pace. You can reread the same sentence multiple times. Like, you, every word is right there. So if there's something you don't know, you can look it up. Whereas if you, could, if you miss something because it was too fast when you're listening, you can't look it up because you didn't hear it. Yeah. And plus there's kanji. Right. It's like so, of course, reading is way easier. And, and because of that, you can take way more away from it. And so if you want to get a vocabulary, then, yeah, reading is by far the best thing you can do. And I think that personally, my vocabulary got to where it is today because of reading novels, because novels right. have like the largest variety of different uh, vocab. You know, right. yeah. I, yeah. I, I feel like words in Japanese, they have like a natural habitat is what I call them. You okay. know, like maybe it's like a, a an engineering word, like. Or, or like maybe it's a like geography word, or maybe it's it's like a, a girly word or whatever. It's like there's words where you, if you go to their hab- natural habitat, they'll show up a lot. Yeah, yeah. But they almost never show up outside of their natural habitat. Yeah. But the thing about the way that some o- Japanese novelists be creative with language is that they purposely use words outside of their natural habitat. You mm-hmm. know, like they'll mm-hmm. take a word that's normally only used for like uh like quantum mechanics and use it for like human emotion. Right. Yeah. And so if you learn all the words that come up in the novels, it, it builds your vocabulary so great, greatly because you're getting little sneak peeks into all these different natural habitats. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I, and so that's why I, I mean, I have a video on novels about but that's the one of the main reasons. And also it's like because you get every different kind of speech, you get normal daily conversation, you get the narration. Yeah. Uh, you, like if the news is on in the novel, then you get news language. You get the news, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the thing is, is that. Like, like I was explaining earlier with pitch accent, uh, your brain's mechanism for improving is failure, you know? And yeah. so, and also, uh, I've done just a little bit of studying into psycholinguistics, and one really interesting thing they found is that when you're listening to a language, you're, there's two processes going happening simultaneously in order to de- decipher the language. Right. First of all, there's the bottom-up process of your brain literally listening to the sounds and then saying, like, what are these sounds? Like, what mm. words contain these sounds? Mm. But at the same time, there's a top-down process of get of looking at the situation and saying, okay, and, and at the sentence meaning, what's the most likely word to be used right here, right now? Uh, right, yeah. And and because, like, raw language input is very kind of poor quality, right? It's like maybe the, it, maybe there's other noise outside, may, and every person has a, a little bit of an idio, idiosyncratic way of speaking, so everyone's speech is a little different. And so just going off the raw sounds isn't enough. That's why, for the longest time, voice-to-text to was so shitty. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. with the the sounds alone actually aren't enough. Only when they're combined with the contextual knowledge and the predictive ability can you actually tell exactly what they're saying. But the yeah. thing is that this happens completely unconsciously. Right. By the time a word hits reaches our consciousness, we already know what it, what it is. It's like our brain's yeah. already like given us the the meaning. It's like we're just receiving the the result of this process. You can't yeah. really yeah. feel it happening. Yeah. But the thing is, is that uh, so. Basically, there's two different skills when it comes to listening ability, right? Those mm-hmm. the, the bottom up and the top down. Your actual ability to parse the phonemes, and then your ability, your predictive ability. Uh, and the other thing before I, that I want to preface this with is that well, having a good accent, like we talked about before, is all about your your ability to to hear what's right or wrong, right? It's all about uh, about auto correction. Like the reason why yeah. deaf people or even people who go deaf later in life eventually stop sounding native is because they can't auto correct. You know. Yeah having the knowledge of what it's supposed to sound like isn't enough. You have to actually be able to have that intuitive sense of as soon as you hear it, you know whether it's right or wrong. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, if you want to have a perfect accent, that ability to parse the phonemes at a very, very subtle level and have that be included in your model of what the language is supposed to sound like is completely crucial. And so the thing is, is that if you let your reading ability get too far ahead of your listening ability, then your knowledge of Japanese, your contextual knowledge, that top down process of predicting ability is going to get extremely strong very quickly. Yeah, and the thing is, is that's going to compensate for your your actual bottom up like phoneme parsing ability. Yeah, and so your listening abilities, like you're gonna, you're gonna, they're, it's gonna having read a lot is gonna help your listening abilities a lot because like when you hear a word, you're gonna 
your brain's going to be able to say, oh, maybe that's this. You know, it's yeah. going to have something, a bank to guess from. And so you're going to improve quickly. But the thing is, is that you're going to reach, once you hit that point of 100% comprehension, which is where improvement stops to a certain degree, right? Because the mm -hmm. brain's mechanism mm -hmm. of improving is failure. Yeah. Uh, the balance between the bottom up and the top down process is going to be out of whack, right? Yeah. It's like you're going to be have heavily relied on the the like predictive conscious ability and you're you're going to have a weak phoneme parsing ability yeah. and that pho posting, po uh, phoneme parsing ability is what you need to have a good accent yeah so that's why people who learn a language through reading end up have signing. such poor accents yeah, yeah right yeah. like yeah. academics and, and stuff like that plus there's that's just the, the issue of when you're reading a text you you you're sub vocalizing it right like you're reading it you a little voice in your head yes. is reading it yes and so in a way even if you're not outputting you're building bad habits like pronunciation habits intonation habits pitch accent habits just yeah. through reading a lot without having the listening abilities to back it up. Yeah. So yeah. I always say that it's okay to have your reading abilities be ahead of your your listening abilities. Like you can let your vocabulary be guided by that, but yeah. never let your listening abilities lag too far behind. Like make sure yeah. there's always like a uh, trying to be like only, 50, 50 sort of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I say, try to get at least fifty percent active immersion because I mean a lot of people are like, oh, well, I got the passive immersion with listening, so I don't need to to worry about it. But yeah. it's like no, you need the active. Yeah. Make at least fifty percent of your active immersion be listening, and yeah. then you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting because I knew of that effect. I knew I because people who do read a lot end up sounding, you know, they end up having weird accents and not necessarily accents like foreign accents. They just sort of sound strange, if you know what I mean. Um, but I never knew why. So that's, that's yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and the thing is that it's hard to reverse that, right? It's, it's just like very, with the pitch yeah. accent. It's like I've, I'm at a hundred percent comprehension, so my brain thinks it's done. Yeah, my unconscious language acquisition yeah. device. So it's a yeah. really tricky issue. Yeah. So even if and also kids, right? They don't learn to read until they're already fluent. Mm, so. That's true. That's true. So your Patreon has blown up recently. Um, you're getting quite <laughs> you're getting quite popular. <laughs> um, you tend to get a lot, a lot of views on YouTube and stuff. Um, and I think all your content's really good and like really helpful for the community. So keep you know, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Um, what's your end goal for that? Like, like, what are you going to bring to the community? If, if 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 you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, similar to how I think about Japanese now, I view this thing more as a process than like kind of having an end goal. Okay. So I'm kind of just going with the flow, but my, my goal or my mission statement, I mean, is just, I want to help as many people as possible yeah. reach their Japanese goals. And yeah. if I can like try to help them become a better person in the process, although that sounds kind of condescending, <laughs> but it's kind of like, it's like, cause I, it's like for, I don't think that learning Japanese is an inherently good or bad thing. I think it's a neutral thing, right? Like, yeah, it I talk about really matter, like, yeah, yeah. At like, the end of the day, not, no one. It's not. No one yeah, cares. It's not, like, it's not, <laughs> like knowing Japanese isn't going to make you a happier person than you yeah, are now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, if you're like like me, I think for a lot of the time I was using Japan as a way to run away from my uh, like <laughs> inferiority, the inferiority complex I had <laughs> growing up in the U.S. You know, and not being a cool kid. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I don't think that's a good motivation, right? And so, I'm. I don't. I don't unconditionally encourage people to do age out or learn Japanese. I think that only it's not for everyone. It's not going to help every like it's not going to help everyone become the best person they could be or or really become a happy person. No. And so that's why you know I encourage meditation partly because I think that it is really going to help uh your your language acquisition process, yeah. but also I think it's going to help you be a lot more honest with yourself and be more aware of of what you're really thinking and feeling yeah. and yeah. you know do what's going to be in your in your best interest. So yeah. yeah. Uh yeah, I mean I still think that there is a lot of room to improve the language acquisition process. Like I said, like with the pitch accent, uh, I think there's because basically Katsumoto's original view of language learning was that second language acquisition is identical to first language acquisition. Yeah. Therefore, if you do what a baby does, you will get the same result. Get the same results, yeah. But I think that that's just not true because I mean, otherwise I would have learned pitch accent, right? Because if a five year old who's had the same amount of input that I have already has mastered pitch accent. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's just clear to me that's not the case. I think it's more like. Because then the, 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 that's Katsumoto's view. The traditional language learning view is uh, the way the mechanism that babies use to learn languages dies after you're 12. And now you're just stuck <laughs> with learning it like it's math. And yeah. so I think those are both wrong. Yeah. I think like the mechanism that babies use to learn a language is never dies. It's still there. Just the thing is, is that as you get older, your brain starts to to get more efficient. And it does this by making assumptions. So it's like if you're a baby when a baby's born, it can hear every sound in every human language, right? Yeah. But just after six months, it can only hear the sounds that are in its native language or the languages that it, it's regularly in contact. And it and and if it gets language input from other languages, it quick it quickly regains the ability. Oh, but okay. the, 
when you think about why does that happen? And I mean, yeah. of course, we know that like Japanese people can't hear the difference between L and R. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's not because their brain has gone to mush. It's because by making the assumption that all sounds that sound like L or like R are actually all the Japanese are, it actually makes them better at Japanese. Yeah. Because okay. like 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 you said, when you were uh, doing your part time job and you couldn't understand what that guy said, yeah. maybe like maybe if you didn't know Japanese and your brain uh, made a, made more assumptions, it would be able to decipher it. Yeah. But because by actually by not considering options that aren't possible, you're more efficient, right? Right. Yeah. So. So your brain actually, in order to get more to get better at the languages it does know, it stops cons- even considering other possibilities that it is, has determined don't exist. Yeah. And yeah. so when you pick up your second language as an adult, you now have to like remove these assumptions that you have. Like I think my brain had an assumption that pitch accent isn't a thing, and that's one that's hard to remove. But mm-hmm. you can remove them. <clears throat> all you need is failure, right? Like all you need is to actually understand the input. And so yeah, uh, with with the caveat of that, you you're working kind of you're it's kind of more like going up current instead of down current because the baby's mind literally is a blank slate. It has no assumptions. Yeah. Now you have to go against your the assumptions your brain has created, but you can still use the same mechanism that you use to acquire the language, right? It's still an unconscious process yeah, yeah, yeah. that happens with comprehensible input, and that's yeah. still the only way to do it. Yeah. But so I want to try to uncover what are the exact conditions for, for this process, right? Because it's still kind of like a black box. It's still kind of a mystery. It's like, yeah, we get the yeah. input, we get fluent, but what yeah. happens in between? Yeah, yeah. And I think that will give us the answers of how can we make this process even more efficient? How can we solve problems like the pitch accent problem and stuff? Yeah. And so yeah. I still, I don't view age as a final product. I think it's, uh, you know, I'm constantly updating the process and getting new ideas. Yeah. And the other thing is that I I'm learning a lot more about how other people's uh, like how other people work through this process, because I only knew me and my experience. But yeah. I'm a pretty weird guy. Like, <laughs> I, like uh, everyone has their own unique experience. So I'm learning like like what do what do people actually need to hear? Like like on an individual basis, like what are some because yeah, yeah. people struggle with things that I didn't struggle with. Some people yeah. have an easy time with stuff that I did struggle with. Yeah. And so I kind of realized that in order to be to do my job well. I need like way more experience, not just with languages, but actually working with other people because that's an yeah. entirely different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I kind of like I really enjoy working with people on my Patreon and hearing feedback and uh, and like and or just even reading the comments, even the nasty ones. It still tells me like, oh, well, if they like it, it, there is some, must be some error on my part because I didn't explain it well enough because they didn't get it. Right, you know, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I kind of yeah, I just feel this as, as a process that I'm, I'm growing along with all my patrons. Like I said, I want under the guise of I want to help everyone master the la- the languages I want to master and hopefully become a better person. And same thing with me. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Just taking it, taking it day by day for now. Yeah. That's a, a brilliant answer. <laughs> that is, yeah. That's awesome. Well, uh, yeah. Definitely go check out his Patreon, guys. <laughs> You'll become a better person <laughs> and fluent in Japanese. <laughs> um, hopefully. 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 <laughs> But no, I think what you're doing is great. Like, honestly, the content, like, since you started making content, like, um, it's helped me out a lot as well. And I think the amount of people that it's helped is is, is crazy, yeah. Yeah, it's really mind-blowing to me just realizing that, you know, even you can actually influence people, you know? You can actually yeah. change people's life. Yeah. Like, Kats- like, I owe my fluency to Katsumoto. Yeah. And just the idea that there, there will most likely will be people who, who will owe their fluency to me is totally mind-blowing yeah, yeah. and crazy and very humbling. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. I know how you feel about the JLPT. If one, will you ever take it? Do you reckon you'll ever take it or will you just not bother? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll probably take it at one point just so I can just fucking... Just so like, all those all those people on Twitter or, or Reddit, sorry, <laughs> or, or all those actors are like, look, okay, here, here it is. Happy <laughs> But, but I mean, I think it's fine to take the JLPT because depending on like, yeah, if you want to work for a Japanese company, then they don't care because they're going to know how good you are after talking to you for 30 seconds. Yeah. But if you if you like if you're in the US and you want to like add being good at Japanese to your resume, it's like having the JLPT. It's like, it, yeah. it's like there's people, although we know it doesn't mean anything, there's yeah. people who think it does mean something. Yeah. And so if you want to work with those people, you might as well take it. Yeah. And the thing is, is that if you're actually good at Japanese, it will be a breeze. You yeah. know, like yeah. if you, you do age at after a year or two, N1 will be a joke to you. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, why not? It's like, yeah, I'd like to take your 50 bucks. But it's yeah. like, yeah, you can uh, you might as well just don't study for it. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Your, your level will has, decrease. Like yeah, your level will like, stick to the level of the JLPT. It won't go any exactly. higher than that. Yeah. Yeah. And any anytime you're studying for a test, then you're breaking the test pretty much because uh, you're not it's no longer testing your ability to for Japanese. It's, t- it's testing your ability to take the JLPT. Yes, and exactly, and, yeah. and and you're and if you train for the JLPT, yes, you'll become able to pass it. But that won't be real Japanese ability. It'll just be JLPT like, ability. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. if you learn real Japanese, if you want to take it, then go ahead. That's yeah. my stance. Yeah, 
yeah, that's fair enough. I think um, I was thinking about taking it purely because if I ever wanted to uh, apply for a, jo- uh, a job over there, like if I were to write, you know, my CV in Japanese and then have like not have the JLPT on there and then say another guy Jin had his CV in, in Japanese and they were both, you know, correct and but he had the JLPT, then to actually get to that interview, like... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's that, really, it's like, in that it's like sense, why not? Worth having, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. But it, it almost seems like if I if I if I don't, and I'm almost just being st- stubborn just to make a point, yeah. just to be like, no, I refuse. <laughs> I will not take this stupid test. But, <laughs> but yeah, fair enough. Do you think you'll ever take the Kankin? Yeah, actually, I think I I think I will. Uh, but mainly because I realize that it's actually extremely easy. <laughs> like they they publish these these practice books for it. Yeah. That basically just have every single thing that you need to know. Yeah. Uh, and you can so it's like so just from an age out perspective, it's like yeah, you just SRS that. Like just spend like <laughs> half an hour a day making cards for That's that, insane. and within a year or two, you'll be able to like get ninety nine percent on the on the hardest one. Because if it's just me- it's like the only reason it's hard is because people don't know what an SRS is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so it's like yeah, how are you going to memorize all these kanji without the SRS? But it's like if you have high stake mentality, right? You you know how to break the characters up and the mnemonics, and you have an SRS, then you, you're it's, good to go. it's easy. Yeah. And yeah. so it kind of seems like, like, why not do that? Like, it's, like, it's like if I want to make my character when I'm in Japan, like the gaijin who's amazing at Japanese, it's like it's, it. <laughs> it's a really nice badge to have on my vest, you know, yeah. because Japanese yeah. people actually are impressed by that. Like they actually care about it. Japanese people love credentials yeah, and certificates. Yeah. Yeah. And so it just kind of seems like like uh, for my character, it'd be a really good like like thing to have <laughs> on, on my resume, you know. So yeah. it's kind of like, why not? Just so I can. Just so I can, like, you know, say, like, say that I have it, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome, yeah. I, it's one of the mini goals that I, well, I say mini goals, it's obviously quite a big goal, but um, that's something that I, I was thinking about doing as well. But I think yeah. it would take me a I few mean, years. It would take me a long yeah, time yeah, like, to... Like, right now, I'm more focused on just fixing my the stuff that yeah. does matter, like my accent. But it's yeah, like exactly, it's like I'm I'm going to be in this for the long haul, so I'm sure I'll I'm sure I'll get to it eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more important things to deal with at the moment. Like, yeah. Um, I actually looked at how many kanji were, were actually in the test the other day. And it's only like five thousand. It's not that much. Yeah, like, and that like, yeah, that's like I thought, from I it was from a age out of point of view. It's like you tell that to someone who uh, who's in a normal Japanese class, and they'd be like they'd be blown away. But it's like, but yeah, like, it, if I you've mean, done okay, one and three, then you've already got yeah. over halfway there. And I know in my in my Anki deck alone, there's like two thousand uh, kanji that aren't in one RTK one or two, like that I have at least in one card somewhere. You know, Christ. and so and that doesn't actually mean that I learned a word that has it because sometimes there's just like an example sentence from right. the definition right yeah, yeah uh and it's and it's a random word and stuff but i mean that just tells me that like it's not nearly as as much as it's like yeah. i'm probably gonna I'm, there's only gonna be a few that i feel like i've literally never seen before probably yeah that'd be awesome to get like just to have a little yeah just to know, say just to be batch, that because yeah. isn't there like a single number of digits of people who pass every year yeah there's not many people that pass and apparently so, it's like, yeah that's out, like, of, out of foreigners is like less than 10 or something yeah, um, and and then and the people that do pass must be Jap- mostly Chinese and Korean. So yeah, yeah. I actually remember seeing a TV show about an American who passed it. Um, that yeah, was I think I saw that too. He wasn't actually good at Japanese though. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't very good. And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, he but, started, spent like all that study time on the wrong thing. But. Yeah, yeah. But there you go. So yeah, talking about I suppose uh, the study aspect. What does your sentence deck look like at the moment? How many sentences? How many cards do you have? Like, do you yeah, still I mean, do a lot of reps a day, and do you still add a lot of cards, or is it like? drop down a lot yeah well i mean i'm probably gonna have less total ascendance cards than most people would imagine i have like fifteen thousand right now okay but i mean if, if you watch my three hour video i stopped repping for like six months last year like completely uh, like i yeah. was like fuck the srs and then after a while i was like actually SRSing is probably a good idea yeah. and it took me forever to catch up because i had like four thousand reps that i needed to do but you didn't do your reps either no i didn't do anything Holy i like shit. threw away the sr that anki because I was uh, like, screw this. Uh, that, and that also, I, uh, I mean, it was only six months. And right. so, I mean, I, I didn't like I actually still remembered most of the cards. But there was I feel like my ability to like when I was reading a Japanese book. Yeah, uh, I, I still knew what all the words meant. But normally, it, like when I'm reading a Japanese book and there's a word where it's like, I think I know what it means, but I'm not sure. Just to check myself, I'll like create a mini Japanese definition of it right then mm-hmm. and there. And I and my ability to do that like dropped because that's basically what I'm doing when I'm repping is like I see the sentence and then there's the word that I that I learned with the sentence and I'll I'll try to like cre- define it in Japanese yeah. to like prove to myself that I'll know that I know it and it also okay. is good practice yeah and so I got really good at that 
Uh, but that kind of went away. And also, that yeah, so there'd be more words that were, it's like, yeah, I, I know what this word means pretty much, but it wasn't as clear. Uh, right, okay. It was like a little more foggy. Yeah. And But the thing is, is like, it was only six months, but I feel like if I would have waited any longer than that, I would have taken a much bigger hit. Right, it was like, yeah. I, I, I only wait, I waited just enough time where the damage wasn't too bad when I picked it up again. But I think if, if I waited like a whole year or multiple years, then it would have been like, you oh, God. Gain a bit, yeah. 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 But I mean, a lot of those cards, it's like they had, they already had interval like intervals of over uh, a year or yeah, even I the suppose, ones that came, yeah. yeah. And so it's like the, the bigger the interval gets, the the less it matters if you miss like if like you know the more room, margin of error there is. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, there was very few where for where I was literally like, what is this? I don't remember this. It was more just like, oh, this is kind of foggy, so I'll fail it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Click again. Yeah. But but so basically, yeah. So I didn't for like a whole, and then after that, I didn't really. I, I got caught up, and I would add slowly, like, five a day, or sometimes less, so sometimes a little bit more, but uh, still pretty slow from then. But I have this long list of, like, a thousand words that I, I want to start uh, making them more, like, just get on it and, and like, knock yeah, that yeah. list down. But, but I mean, I've also want, I've been thought making other other cards. Okay, well, before I go, say that what I was about to say, but... So, one the problem I had with sentence cards, and mm-hmm. you can tell me if this happened to you, is once your intervals get really big... Sometimes yeah. the word comes up and it's like you know about what it means, but it's kind of foggy and you can't tell it, it apart from all these synonyms because it's like you know there are a lot of synonyms. Yeah. Uh, in Japanese, so it would be like okay, I know what this means, but I don't know. I only know like roughly what it means. I don't know like exactly how it's different than all the yeah, synonyms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean that's that's fine. It doesn't really matter. And 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 again, what I'm about to say now, it's only a problem once you're like already really fluent and you're trying to like do what I'm doing, which is like crystal clear understanding of every word in the dictionary, yeah. which is not necessary or anything. It's like, this is just my weirdo uh, OCD <laughs> thing. Because normally, even if you if the, if the your un- SRS understanding is kind of foggy, immersion fixes all that for you, yeah. you know? And yeah. so it's like, if, if you're not fluent yet, it doesn't, even if the card comes up, you only kind of know it, it's fine because you're going to see that a, a bunch of times. And, yeah, and you'll see it again, so you can just yeah. do what you like. But, it doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But for me, for now, I have a lot of cards where it's like, I might only see that once a year or yeah. less. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, I, I'm relying on the SRS to keep my knowledge of that word kind of sharp. Yeah, and yeah. so I found that what in so sentence cards are great in the in the beginning and until fluency. But once you get to that point, since they're only recognition and there's no production production mm-hmm. aspect, it's kind of weak. And yeah. so I kind of uh, I thought about making uh, making close cards. But the thing is, is that uh, like. I, and oh, MCDs, I actually, like, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. I don't. I, I hate the idea of MCDs. I'm too. I'm too OCD to have a bunch of text. I'm going to not read. I'm going to read everything I saw on my card. Yeah. But I thought about just making like basically a sentence on the front, but the words hidden, and then you have the definition of the hidden word on the front as well. Uh, uh, okay. And, and you have to guess. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe like actually write it out so you get writing practice too. Uh, okay. Uh, but when I made a bunch of those, I found that after a while, I just memorized the card, and I wouldn't really like actually memorize the meaning of the word. Yeah. It, it's like as soon as I see the card before I even read it, I just I know what the answer was. Yeah. And and then I have to like force myself to try to like not cheat and actually know the word. And mm-hmm. that wasn't very fun. Mm-hmm. But I did get better at like writing them and like they're clearer in my head. It's like when I had the sentence card, the the meaning part was really clear, but the word itself was blurry. Right, but okay. when I did these, the word was really clear, but the meaning part was blurry. <laughs> and so then I had this idea like, well, what if I just made two words for every card? Uh, or sorry, two cards for, for every word. word. One Let's do both. Yeah. Yeah, and and that sounds like twice the work, but it's actually only about one point five times the work because having two cards makes each card easier. You know, they they reinforce yeah. the knowledge. Yeah, and I'd rather have a lot of easy cards than fewer harder cards. Yeah. And so I've been yeah. messing around with that, and I find that it's been working really great. Like I know these words a lot better now, uh, and it, it is more total rep time. Uh, so I mean, there is that, and I'm not. I haven't been doing it with every word. I make a sentence card for every word I want to learn, and then if I feel like it's a slippery word. Like maybe I know a bunch of synonyms for it or something like that. Then I'll make the additional close card. Okay, so it's not yeah. all just to make it stand out a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Or like when I'm doing my sentence reps, if there's a word comes up and I realize it's slippy, then slippery, then instead of failing it, sometimes I'll just make a close, a new close card for it instead. Okay. So yeah. I've been messing around with that and that's been working pretty good so far. But again, don't, don't worry about this. If you're not fooling it, it literally yeah, doesn't yeah, matter. Just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting though. All right, and then about. also, yeah, like for pitch accent, I thought of, uh, I kind of have this idea for a card where it's basically just a just a Japanese sentence on the front, like the audio, no yeah. text, 
yeah. and you basically just like pay attention to the pitch accents and like try to hear them all and like how they relate to the intonation. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, do you know, I think I've heard someone mention that before, but just f- not necessarily for pitch accent, just for just c- for comprehension. Like just have audio on the front and then the text on the back, for example, and try and. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah, but I think but, but for, for pitch for, accent, for this yeah, case, I can see that. Yeah, for because you already understand it anyway. But it's just how, how having you pay because the thing is is that although the actual like like for example if you like I said before if you have a word and it can be like hey like a noun right is the most two common patterns for like a, a two kanji noun are either it's flat or it goes down so it's like yeah. bing kyo's flat jin says goes down yeah. so uh but the thing is although that the rough pattern is always the same depending on the context of the like the sentence the intonation pattern will like move it around a little bit you know okay. like nani yatten da yo it's like it's still if you if you listen yeah. the yaru is like this the pitch accent hasn't changed because it's the same thing with the verbs they either go down or stay flat so it's yatten da yo so the fact that it's going up and not down means the pitch accent is still there yeah cuz whereas if it was like uh sore machi gatten da yo it's like it got then it goes down yeah right it goes there. down then yeah so even though that it sounds totally different cuz intonation is messing it up it's like the pitch accent is still there but so it's kind of like so instead of trying to come up with a formula of uh, like how do you calculate what the final thing is going to be like intonation plus pitch accent equals this and instead of doing that like because there's a limited number of intonation patterns mm. and there's a limited number of pitch accent patterns so what I thought what if you just multiplied them all together and learned them all on a case by case basis so and then I thought how would you do that well you could just make cards like on the sentence level and just just think of the whole thing as one thing like don't even think of intonation and pitch accent as separate just think of like okay like this is I, one uh, combination this is another yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and so basically what pitch accent mean is that there are these a limited number of these total combinations just you can only use certain words with certain combinations right so yeah. it's like there's one na 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 pattern and you can only use like uh like half the verbs in that pattern and what the pitch accent tells you is whether the verb can fit into the pattern or not so it's kind of this paradigm shift where they're like one thing it's kind of abstract but once you get used to it it sounds like a really good idea because it basically it allows you to, to not have to be thinking about all these complicated rules because yeah. you just take a flat approach it's like you just heard the pattern so many times that uh you can replicate it or maybe you'll notice it more and so i'm still just experimenting with that uh right now but basically i have a have this idea where uh it's basically yeah just audio on the on the front and you just pay attention to it and maybe try to say it and that's kind of it it sounds like it could work like i understand yeah i get your logic there yeah yeah like i don't think it's the ultimate solution no to but the it, big it, promise it, of ever, but it, it could help it could help yeah yeah it could yeah. push you in the right direction awesome. and it also just be a good way to memorize the individual pitch accents of words yeah, like, yeah, yeah and the combination system yeah yeah, cool. yeah yeah awesome uh is there anything else you used anki for like uh, you... yeah well well okay so besides so you know i have like i said i have the the pitch accent that's a thing and then the the these words for vocab but i actually have a lot of cards for japanese that aren't like for example i have etymology cards where i have some some things where i'm just like hey what's the etymology of this word and right. then the back is just like uh like a two sentence explanation of it all in uh, japanese etymology what does that mean again <laughs> etymology it's like like how the word came to be like what's all oh, right uh, yeah okay yeah like what's one i just learned the the other day i'm trying to think uh like like shiroto you know the, that word yeah, yeah. Uh, it means like a uh, beginner or a noob. It pretty much yeah. means noob. Yeah. Uh, so it, it turns out it comes from shirohito, which means white person. Okay. And because back in the day when they, people used to play eagle, uh, the person who sucked would be the white and the person who was good would play black. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so it's like, I just, it's, I mean, that's not, it's not directly related to your Japanese ability, but no, I mean, but it's, it's cool fun to know. Like, yeah. 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 And it's like, I mean, mostly I just enjoy it. I'm just, I'm just a language otaku. Like I'm a Japanese <laughs> otaku. So I just love learning that stuff. So whenever I see a word and I can tell that there's some kind of story behind it, uh, yeah. I go and like look up the story and then mem- memorize it because some yeah. of them are pretty interesting. Yeah, like uh, what was that? that was oh, like, I don't, I don't uh, know if I know that yet. I might have to go learn that after <laughs> after this interview. It's good hard for it. Well, I believe you sent me a link to it a while back because I posted about it on Twitter. I was like, why does it have this kanji? It makes no sense. It's so weird. Like for a tap, why? And well, there you a- go. I used to know it and I forgot it because <laughs> I didn't make a card for it. That's why I make the cards for it. <laughs> I can't really entirely remember. I think it was something to do with Chinese dragons and. Like, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, see, I mean, that was probably before I started making the cards because I hated that feeling of like, oh, I used to know this, but now I don't. Yeah. So, and I, I also have sometimes I'll make a, a, a card just for the meaning of a kanji because it's like you know how uh, every once in a while there'll be a kanji that has well, okay, for example, uh, if you if you know the word uh, disoku, it means like interest on a loan. Yeah. yeah. And it turns out that the that kanji for soku it's also for iki, right, which means to breathe, like yeah. breathe out. Yeah. Uh. So it turns out that the that kanji also has the meaning of uh, of like to give birth to, 
and a spe- and it's also used to mean muskel because it's also the one in muskel, right? All right, yeah, yeah. And so it ha- it has this meaning of like uh, uh to give birth to something. And so disoku in the word disoku, it's d is the parent, and uh the soku is the kid. So it's like the parent is the mon- the money that you loan out, and then the kid that comes back from that is the interest. <laughs> and so that's why the word soku is in disoku. So I just have a card where I'm just like, hey, in the word disoku, what does like soku mean? And sometimes I'll have words like that where it's like, hey, in this word, what does this kanji mean? Because it'll be like different than the normal use of it. Yeah, and it'll be yeah. useful to remember. Like like the word I had another one the other day, like, you know, ryaku, which just means like abbreviation. Mm, yeah. So normally it means abbreviation, but sometimes it'll also mean kasume toru, which is like to like steal forcefully. Mm, uh, like mm, there's this word go ryaku. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where um, it means like, like ryaku. Take, yeah. like forcefully take something yeah yeah, yeah or like yeah and so i yeah, wanted yeah. to i just have a card where i just have like two example words like ryakudatsu, go ryaku, and then it's like in these words what does ryaku mean and if you look it up in the dictionary it means kasume toru and yeah. so i just learned that just because it's youth it's like helpful so i have some cards like that uh that's pretty cool and also yeah like just and also just like random things about japanese history or japanese culture oh also play i learned places a lot like uh like right. i i learned all the prefixures in japan i, I learned to do it <laughs> i gave up <laughs> yeah oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, what I what I did is I just took a map of Japan and I put a number on every prefixure, right. and then for each one I have two cards. One where it says, "Hey, what is number one?" and then another one that says, "Hey, That's like, good way of doing what, it. O- what number is Okayama prefixure?" Uh, and then I I also learned all the districts and and cities within Tokyo, and uh, uh, the same way. And then I also have random cards where it's just like, "Hey, what prefixure is ha- is uh, Hakodate shi in?" or like like what district in Tokyo is Akasaka in? Uh, just stuff like that. That's like it only takes a second to make, a second to learn, but it's really useful to know. Yeah. Uh, like because when someone when Akasaka comes up and you're like you know like uh you're like what the hell okay. is that like yeah like like that's in uh, Minatoku I know yeah. now and then I have in my map and not like okay it's a that's general cool. area yeah yeah uh, I attempted doing well, I attempted in the prefectures once but I I just did it based on this area like the shape I, I never <laughs> which oh, is no, really no. hard to do because I don't even know yeah, yeah, no, Japan really. that's, that's an awful idea because we yeah, have, it's have spatial memory you know you remember it in in comparison to where it is around that so yeah, yeah. I can I can send so, you my deck for it later you you can put yeah, it up on your it. website if you want yeah yeah uh, that'd be awesome uh, yeah um, yeah, so just little things. Oh, also, I memorize celebrities a lot, too. Uh, that is a good idea. I've heard other people do that as well. Because, I mean, obviously, this is another icing on the cake thing. Like, if you're not fluent yet, then you don't need to worry about this. Yeah. But, uh, basically, well, there's two two benefits of it. Like, one is that, first of all, Japanese names are, are hard to... It's like, they basically have to think of them as their own words. Because yeah. they follow their own kanji rules. And so yeah. you have to learn how to read names separately than from words. Yeah. And so, it, but instead of just memorize like, just SRSing random names... If you memorize celebrities, then it's like two birds with one stone because now you're also getting some cultural knowledge at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And and having the cultural knowledge of celebrities is actually really important because like like if, if you think like if you're talking to someone in English, like you assume that they know who Brad Pitt is, and so yeah. maybe you even use Brad Pitt as like a metaphor for someone who's good looking, right? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or something like that. And so basically, if, if there's something that you, you assume that everyone knows and you might actually use it in conversation. Then, then that's just as important learning. as any other word, yeah, right? That's, that's very true. I had that thought earlier, and I was like, "That's exactly." Yeah, and, and the other thing is that when Japanese people ask you, like, "Hey, you have a girlfriend? Yeah, what does she look like?" The way you answer that is you say, "It looks like you added like Ari Murakasumi and Aragaki Yui, and then divided it by two. Yeah. Like that's how they. <laughs> that's how they. they uh, that's the Japanese way of say of describing yeah, how people yeah, look. Yeah, yeah. So you have to have a vocabulary of celebrities so that you can do that. And when other Japanese people do that to you, you're going to actually know, like, oh, okay, so your girlfriend's ugly or something. Like you can. Uh, <laughs> I think it's really important. So and and so what I've been doing now is I just have a picture on the front, and then I actually write out the names because there's a lot of. Uh, like like Hiroki right has like ten thousand different kanji to write that with right and yeah. so I, when I want to remember like what kanji it is I actually just write it out and then you get more writing practice so yeah, I just have picture awesome. on the front and then I have a pen and a paper uh, and I I actually write it out and that's yeah. been working pretty well awesome yeah it's definitely something that I think I'm gonna do, start doing as well because yeah yeah names I I'm terrible with names like it's just yeah I was I was for a long time too and I still am and and I mean it's Japanese people because... suck. Like, stuck more than you would think because like i remember yeah. when i was went to japanese school on the first day of school the teacher like took attendance and he messed up like one third of all the names like he read it <laughs> the wrong way so <laughs> i'll never forget that so yeah. it's kind of like you can cut yourself some slack in that yeah maybe. you can you really can i mean i have a conversations with uh, with my girlfriend and i've said like um could be like an artist or, or whatever i would just send her uh, the name and she'd be like how do you read this <laughs> you know it's quite common yeah i think they struggle yeah. with reading names as, as much as 
we will say. So. Especially celebrities, because they like to be fancy and creative. And so, like, when they yeah. choose their pen, they'll, like, choose weird stuff. Oh, and uh-huh. also, I have some Anki cards that are totally unrelated to Japanese. Like, I have stress cool quotes. <laughs> Uh, where I just put a quote and and if uh, if it when it comes up if I feel inspired I'll hit fail so I see it more often. Uh, is that English? Not a, yeah, uh, English uh, yeah. and Japanese. I've got like, a friend who does that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really cool because sometimes yeah. it's like uh, you're in a like you added something like I added I added a quote a year and a half ago and now I'm in a totally different place in life so it has a new meaning to me you know yeah. so it's cool to it's to be cool, shown yeah. it again. Yeah. Plus, uh, I mean, you can use it in content creation. Like, if you were to make a video, you could use that. You could use it. It's a good like analogy or, or whatever so it's yeah, useful yeah. As well. yeah 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 i didn't even think of that that's a really good idea yeah so, <laughs> but, so cool yeah. yeah i think i mean srs is always like i mean y- you, you forget that there's that it does a cost to it because it feels like like just oh i'm, I'm now easy. i'm never gonna forget yeah. it but you forget you have to review forever yeah yeah so yeah. there is a cost it's, but yeah. it's still insanely efficient yeah yeah definitely think, a game factor. like i i sometimes look back at myself in, in like school and stuff and i was like if only i had an srs <laughs> If only I knew about Anki in school, I'd, life would be so much easier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it takes a whole a whole another level of discipline to actually SRS your school stuff because it's like it's one thing to SRS stuff you actually want to learn, but to I'll always be doing those reps for this thing that you don't care about at all, and you know that you're going to delete the second the class ends. It's like because I, I remember. Yeah. One of my friends, uh, Patrick, every single semester, he's like, this semester, I'm actually going to SRS all my schoolwork. <laughs> and I mean, I think he has succeeded a few times, but it just goes to say, it's like, you know how hard it is to do your reps with Japanese, yeah. so you actually want to learn. Yeah. So it's actually, hard, the one but... deck that I do less of is my software engineering deck, which <laughs> is hilarious because I'm actually studying that at university. So it should be like the thing I want to do, but instead Japanese is the thing I want to do. So like <laughs> I end up just, if I do all my reps in Japanese, I'm like, oh, I can't be asked to do anymore. Then I just, I, you know, I just won't do my software engineering deck, and it was just, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it, terrible. It can kind of suck. I mean, yeah. I kind of, I kind of get a, like, deal with that issue by just mixing up a lot of different stuff in one deck, so that, so that I can't like avoid just one part of it. Ah, uh, yeah, it's good. Idea. Yeah, but, but I mean, yeah, and also formatting your cards can get you a long way. Like that's uh, true. Yeah, like having like, massive blocks of text is just pointless. Like yeah, yeah, like a second, the second you see that, it. your brain just like punishes you a little bit. Yeah. Like yeah. It's just like oh, that's you got to format but, it properly. Otherwise, you're not gonna. Well, for a start, you're not gonna remember it, and secondly, you're gonna have, you're just gonna be sat there like going fail, fail, fail for ages. So yeah, you really do need to format. Yeah, and I think that's an art you got to develop over time. Like yeah. that's why I always tell people don't use pre-made decks. Like even from RTK start making your own deck because it gets you familiar with how to use Anki. You start getting, you learning yeah. what you can do, what your yes. options are. And because making cards is an art and it's like, you need to perfect that art it's because true. there's yeah. going to be unique issues you run into in your journey, learning Japanese that yeah. you're going to have to come up with your own new card formats to combat, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's totally true. Yeah. I think actually knowing HTML and CSS a little bit helped me. <laughs> like yeah, I mean, I, I, like... I learned a, like a basic HTML, like so I could do c- conditionals and stuff like that. I wish I knew more. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I never thought about that, but yeah. Plus, it's also the fact that a lot of the pre-made stuff is crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. well, because I mean, most of it, it's like, yeah, you want to be learning stuff that you actually like. You actually took from your it. environment, and it's actually like on your level and stuff, and then it won't be yeah. boring and stuff like that. But, yeah. but yeah, even even because I mean, like some people, even with RTK, right? It's like you can make a better argument for the pre-made deck because it's like you already as long as you make your own stories right it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. why why input it all yourself but i think like no even on that you should because it even on rtk like, yeah it's, it's like what it's like it's just like how you're always going to love your own kid better than an adopted kid it's like yeah. that's how i feel with pre-made <laughs> decks it's like you make it yourself you're gonna have you're gonna have <laughs> more <laughs> you're gonna like it you know it's like it's gonna have a connection to you you're it's yeah. gonna be harder to neglect fair enough yeah <laughs> I know it's kind of fucked up analogy. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we spoke about this briefly earlier on. Um, do you plan on learning another language later on, like, or do you just want to fo- like get super good at Japanese and English? Like, I, I do. Know I do about really want to. Times. Yeah, I still do want to learn Mandarin, and yeah. I mean, I'm contemplating it more and more now because of the pitch accent thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, and also, knowing Chinese would have many benefits in my journey to to be a scholar of of Japanese. Right. Uh, because it, it would like it would be really cool to learn because I mean modern day Japanese is like half classical Chinese, and so I really want to learn classical ch- uh, Chinese because I mean up until the Edo period every in- Japanese intellectual was fluent in in written uh, classical Chinese. That's insane. And <sighs> yeah, yeah, it really is. And so I want uh, so, but I think it would be it, it's like really a bitch to learn classical Chinese through Japanese, which mm-hmm. is what Japanese people have been doing. 
for like thousands of years. But it's like if you can learn classical Chinese like through modern Chinese. day Mandarin, yeah, yeah, then Easy. you can actually like read it. Because basically, what what Japanese people do is Japanese people have created this. It's called kundoku. Like a thousand years ago, Japanese people created this like systematic system to translating uh, classical Chinese into like Japanese esque language right okay yeah like it's basically it's, not, it's still incomprehensible but it's like <laughs> you change the word order around and conjugate stuff so that it's like looks kind of like japanese yeah and and then you learn it from there and yeah. so that's like basically japanese people learn how to do this in school they actually learn uh how to do this yeah all these little marks of like you add in the numbers to change the word order and like then you add in the particles and stuff yeah 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 but uh, you could just totally bypass that if you're if you're fluent in modern day Mandarin because the word order is the same. Yeah, you can just uh, like yeah, and you can actually sure. pronounce it out loud, you know, without having to like change it all. So yes, yeah. there's that. Plus, also uh, like just the just the idea that there's a language that's all co- written in 100 percent kanji. Yeah. Uh, I think it's cool. yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Like I, and, <laughs> I have that sometimes. I'm like, oh, learning Chinese would be pretty cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like just the idea that people because basically it's like, wait, so they're like just talking in kanji? Like, <laughs> and so I, I think I probably will one day. I don't know how far I'll go with it. Like, I don't. I probably won't ever. Japanese will probably always be my main bitch, but uh i think I'll, I'll probably goof around with it at one point and, yeah, and yeah. see because also like i do feel like it's part of the ajat tradition in a way because uh, cuss did it <laughs> yeah to do that l3 and so uh yeah i'm definitely on with that i'd be pretty interested because i can't imagine managing three languages being that easy well he he learned mandarin and cantonese Oh, he did, uh, didn't he? Yeah, he did do Cantonese, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think Katz did reach a pretty good level of fluency in all all those. I mean, I don't think he was ever at, at, in any of them at that level that I'd like to be where you're completely indistinguishable and perfect, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I remember actually, I was just talking to someone the other day who, who knows Katz personally. Oh, really? And, uh, and, he, and, and he's, he's pretty good friends with Katz's girlfriend right now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was saying that, that the other day he was uh, like, he was doing a lot of Chinese, and then Japanese friends came over, and they spoke Japanese. And then his and his girlfriend told him, "He's like, hey, your pronunciation sounds kind of weird in Japanese." And and that like really upset him, and he like really freaked out, and it was like, "Oh God, oh no, well, I have to go back." Like, it started doing Japanese all the time again and stuff. And so I am. It's like I, it seems like it's just from that little bit. I it sounds like it's just how you would imagine, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's it, I don't. I would never want to have that burden on myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I feel like if I was going to learn Chinese or a third language, I would want to be living in Japan first. If you're in Japan, then maintaining maintaining Japanese is going to be a lot easier because you're going to live your life in it. And yeah. then you know your native language is never going to require as much maintenance. And so then you could do all Chinese all the time in Japan. So if I was ever going to get yeah. serious about that, that's. I would probably hopefully be in Japan first. And also, J- 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 Katz is not in Japan right now, by the way. So that's, uh, you know. Why he's Japanese he's, sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, why the extra struggle? So, yeah, if you were to learn another language, or if you were to learn Japanese again um, from scratch, would there be anything specifically that you would do differently knowing what you know now? I would read less and listen more. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't I would let my, my reading get so far ahead of my listening for the reasons I talked about earlier. And I'd start becoming more aware of pitch accent earlier on like a year probably a year into it start (laughs) implementing that and mm, i'd probably focus more on getting really really good at easy stuff and less on being able to kind of do hard stuff when i would i would as soon as i could read like once i could read modern novels it's like i I was like okay where's the harder novels you know where's the, <laughs> where's the more difficult ones when, when in reality I, like yeah. i still read way slower than a native speaker it took me more effort to read it when because now i really value how much effort it takes to do something i yeah. think the, the main signature of being a native speaker is that it's effortless for you to do all the things that you can do yeah. and so i i i wish instead of like going on and reading natsume soseki and like hundred year old novels which was great for my vocabulary i should have just read like a shit ton of like modern day easier novels yeah because then it would have been more effortless and natural for japanese and maybe even same with listening like yeah. just like really hit the basics really hard uh and make that really strong foundation that's that's what i kind of would have would done okay so we've got a few questions from twitter and um so basically this guy is stuck at the moment he feels like he's making no progress um is there any way that you can any advice that you could give him that would help him get over that yeah well i mean the first thing is just to kind of accept that you know slumps are just a part of the process that is really completely inevitable like i always would go through periods of feeling like i like i suck and maybe even i got worse and like 
my goal is so far away. And then a few months later, I'd, I'd feel like, oh, wow, I'm so good. I'm way better than I used to be. Like, this is awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm making a lot of progress. And I think the reality is that uh, you get a little bit better and then you realize how bad you actually are. And so it feels like you've gotten worse. But really, you're, the reason why you feel worse is because you've actually gotten better and you're more aware of the reality. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like in Japanese, they call it muchi no chi. Uh, which is like it comes from Socrates, which is saying like you know you're wise enough to know how how oh, unwise you are. Unwise you are, yeah. Like yeah. And yeah, and so I mean, if you whenever you enter one of these slumps where you feel like oh man I suck, and just be aware that even if it feels like you've gotten worse, have the intellectual knowledge that actually that's a sign of progress, and ever, it happens to everyone. And you never, it's like I it, I still happen like it happens to me where I feel like man shouldn't I be better? You focus on all the little things that you still miss. And stuff, and then other times where when then you start focusing on all the stuff that you can do, and you feel really good. And so it's like try to have a meta awareness of the process, not really let it get get you down, and just focus on what you're actually doing instead of how far you're you're getting. Yeah, I think that's because one of the important things. Yeah, that yeah that can be it's, it can be hard to see how much where you're getting, but I mean it's like if you learn 15 sentences every day on Anki, then your vocabulary is increasing, right? Like yeah. undeniably, you have the numbers to back it up. Yeah, and it, it's like how many anime series are you finishing a week? Like how many hours are you doing passive listening? How many how many books are you finishing? Because yeah. if you put in the time, you will improve. And so just try to focus on how much you're actually doing and, and not like yeah, what you're yeah. Like I, I think mini goals are always a good thing. They can be bad. <laughs> for example, I had goals for getting to um, 1,000 sentences, 2,000 sentences. And I had periods of time where I'd be like, right, I'm going to do 100 sentences a day and it'd just be insane, right? I don't think that's good, but... Having having the goal to say I don't know read a certain yeah like a book a week month, or, yeah, yeah yeah just having that there and then having sort of that uh, that feeling of accompl- uh, accomplishment from from doing it is is a great way of counteracting that sort of feeling of like oh I suck oh I'm not making any progress um, yeah totally yeah. we've got another question how can I use beginner textbooks efficiently okay well here's the thing is that uh, a lot of people think that Ajat is and me are anti textbook. But yeah. that's not true at all. Like Katsumoto recommended a book called All About Particles, which is a form of textbook. Used that. That's, yeah. I recommend Tay Kim's Guide, which is a textbook. I mean, they're not ganky, <laughs> yeah. but they're still textbooks, right? But yeah. the key is, yeah. is that you have to know the role of uh, grammar, learning grammar in general, is not to help you produce Japanese. It's no. to help you understand. It's to make yeah, Japanese comprehensible. Because Stephen Krashen says it's like you acquire language through understanding messages in the language. Yeah, yeah. So anything that that turns and makes that language comprehensible so that you can understand it is, is going to help you greatly. And yeah. so grammar is a good tool to make things comprehensible. Yeah. But that's I, totally different than actually using it to produce Japanese. It's like you don't have to actually know all the different types of verbs and then memorize the rules to conjugate into the Tay form. Right? Yeah, all you need yeah. to know is there is a thing called Tay form. It kind of looks like this. <clears throat> and it kind of means this. And so what I would do is, uh, you know, get get your book and read the explanations, but don't mm-hmm. get anal about them. And then just like make sentence cards for the, all the example sentences. Yeah, that's and then what I would put whatever well. you need on the back. Like that's yeah. what I would do. Yeah, that's what I would do too. Yeah. And also don't like don't over rely on it. Like once you get the basics, then you Move don't on. need yeah. any more of that. Like, you know, it's like some people take that way too far. It's like yeah, you know, and they just keep buying textbooks, and it just never ends. And like yeah, it's like just... Japanese is your real textbook, right? Yeah. Like act yeah. real Japanese. Yeah. So treat textbooks as a stepping stone. Yeah, um, exactly. It's a training wheel. I never really used one. I didn't really want to at all. I was like, no, I'm not going to use textbooks. But um, I still use take ims. But what I did is. Basically, I used it like a dictionary. So if I was going through and I was learning a sentence, and I was like, oh, this this piece of grammar I don't understand, then I would look that up, if you know what I mean, like as if yeah, it was yeah. a word in, in a dictionary. So I would just do that. Um, and then I'd put an expl- explanation in my in my sentence. So, uh, yeah, do it like that. Treat it yeah, as... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Treat grammar as words and, like, yeah. I mean, a really important thing to emphasize is that like the the way that we're taught in the Western world is that like don't move on until you understand it perfectly. Yeah, that's right? no. But that's that, that's not how it works. It's like you're no. not going to understand it perfectly, no matter if you like like people literally have ri- written whole books on Wa and Ga. But you could read that whole book; you're still not going to get it because language is an intuitive thing, not like an intellectual activity like math. Yeah. And so you have to be okay with ambiguity. Like your success depends on that. So yeah. even if it's like people want textbooks because it gives the <clears throat> illusion of the, of a clear understanding. Yeah, but yeah. in reality, that's just mental masturbation. And you just have to get comfortable with the fact <laughs> that you only kind of get it. Yeah. Oh, right. and one other thing is people yes. always ask me, uh, what do I after take him or after I get the basics? How do I learn grammar? But the way I think about it is that it's like af- besides the very raw basics, there's yeah. no real difference between grammar and vocab. Because no, it's like, like, 
like particles are just words, right? They're in yeah, the yeah, Japanese yeah. Japanese dictionary, yeah. you know, and and any like anything like that you need is going to be in the dictionary, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, any constructions, you know. And so if you already have the very basics, then jisho.org will have anything you need. Like if it's mm. like oyari nagara, like that nagara, it's like mm. that's a word. It's just a mm. word. It's not grammar. Yeah. It's just a word, and yeah, it's yeah. in the dictionary. Yeah, that's and exactly so, what I think. Yeah. I, it, so yeah, as, as far as I was concerned, when I was going through this, it's like grammar doesn't exist. It, like yeah, it does, and people are going to argue that it does. So I'm not going to say that it doesn't. But from my point of view, I just treated grammar as what it was just right. You know, the te form. If that comes up, like I would look it up as if it was a word. Like so yeah, exactly. Like activity. I remember, I one really big insight I had that changed my whole outlook on Japanese was realizing that. Literally, the entire Japanese language is encapsulated within the Japanese to Japanese dictionary. All you have to do, all you have to do, is know what to look up. Like every single grammatical construction that seems yeah. like "quote unquote" grammar is actually explained in the dictionary if you know what to look up correctly. You know like all the up, particle yeah. usage, you know. but even like how to actually conjugate verbs is explained in the dictionary. You know, like because because yeah. basically the way it works is that there's no such thing as, con- I mean, in Japanese, verbs have different forms and then different things attached to different forms. Mm. So if you learn the names of the different forms of the verb, then you just learn like, hey, this, like, nagara attaches to what's called the reyoke of verbs, you know, okay. which is, ya, like, it's it's the same form that mas attaches to. Mas is actually what's called an auxiliary verb in, in real Japanese. There's no such thing as a mas form. Mas is a fucking word. It's in the dictionary, and it attaches onto the, the reyoke of verbs. Yeah. And yeah. if you want to know the ren, like, like the reyoke of verbs, it, it also explains that, too. It's like, it's all... It's all just words combining with each other. I, yeah, I think yeah. of it like Legos. It's like different they, yeah. different blocks fit onto each other in different ways. That's a good metaphor. You, if you ever try to learn classical Japanese, you'll notice you'll start thinking that way because it's the same way except more complicated. There's more types of verbs and there's more different conjugations and everything. Mm-hmm. It's like Japanese has gotten much simpler over time. So, mm-hmm. Have you got any specific pieces of media that you think are like... Everybody has to see this. This is so good. Like, is there any particular? Yeah. Well, if you're a Japanese learner, then I would say Terrace House for sure. And I, yeah. I mean, some people are gonna have uh, the skikirai. They're gonna like or dislike it, like personally. But as a Japanese learner, it's like the most valuable resource ever. Yeah. Plus, yeah. I actually like the show, so I definitely recommend that. Yeah. And I'm also I I think a lot of people kind of only stick with anime and and stuff, and they don't branch out of 3D stuff. Yeah. But I'm I'm a big fan of 3D, and I mean anime is great, but I'm a big fan of of like Japanese live action movies. And it's hard, like it's hard to find the good ones, but the good ones are really good. So, like some of my favorite Japanese live action movies are uh, Boys on the Run, Linda, 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 Moteki, Kirishima Bukatsuyamaru Teyo, Jose Totora to Sakana Tachi, Sayonara Kabukicho, and uh, like the Bakuman live action movie is pretty good. Yeah, uh, Fish Story is pretty fun. So yeah, I would I would check those out. If if you if you think that Japanese movie sucks, then come watch some of these movies. Maybe it'll change your mind. Cool. Cool. I'll definitely check them out as well, because movies is one thing that I've never really got into. Well, this I, is the thing. Most Japanese movies fall into to one of two categories. They either are super corny, it's like, like anime so, trying to be 3D but yeah. failing miserably, it's like cosplay and cringe, yeah. Yeah. and the other one is just, it, the quality is really nice and there's good acting, but it's just super fucked up, and it's about like people killing their family and people's heads <laughs> falling off and stuff like that. But every once in a while, there's like some in-between movie where it's like a normal good movie with actually good acting and production value, and it's actually just really good. And so I like so the movies I said are what I consider to be one of those rare uh, gems. Brilliant. And yeah, where can people find you online? Yeah, well, I mean, my YouTube channel, uh, Matt vs. Japan, my Twitter, at Matt vs. Japan, and my Patreon, patreon.com slash Matt vs. Japan. Awesome. Definitely go check it out, guys. He's got some awesome content. And I, yeah, like, honestly, we are probably the most, you've, you've got to be the best speaking gaijin on the internet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I would definitely check out his stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. It was really yeah, fun. Thanks for being here. It's been great.